Hello and welcome to the pre-show. We are arbitrarily driving down the northern boundary of Juma, heading towards the west. There we heard some alarm calls and we heard some Apollo alarm calls this morning in this area. So who knows, maybe there's a leopard around here. Maybe there's just sand and trees and grass and leaves. Just checking to make sure there are no tracks coming in from Buffalo's Hook. Wow, this is the first time I've found this flower on Juma. I've seen it on Torchwood before. Smell that, Vim. What does that smell like? Nice. It smells like pudding. Like pudding. Well, it, I don't know if anyone remembers a sun cream called Pisbane in a dark brown tube. It smells like coconut oil. Uh, it's a cool little plant. It actually doesn't have any English names. It's called a Hemizygia pretoria. Uh, it's a no common name. I must remember where this one is. It's the first time I've seen it growing on Juma. Uh, it normally grows on disturbed rocky soils, and we don't have too many of those there. There we go, pretty pink little flower. Hemizygia pretoria. And you know, I think Final Control would really like that smell, but shame, we should just leave the, the little plant growing there for now. Then we're getting comes. Oh, baby Impala. Here we go. There's a little baby Impala. Yeah. It's the fourth one I've seen so far. So not too many of them yet, but I think most of the females are going to be dropping shortly. There's some very fat ladies out there. Hello, little one. Too cute. Well, we're coming to the end of the pre-show, so we're gonna go start looking for some birds because of course today is a big birding day. And we're trying to get over 50 species in two drives, which I think we'll be able to do quite easily. This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. So from the fast and nimble impala to the slow and stealthy leopard tortoise. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Safari Live. Ready? Standing by. 
and welcome to Safari Live. My name is Byron and with me on camera this afternoon is Hat. And then on the other vehicle you may have seen a Brent already with the pre-show drive and he is with VM. And then this afternoon Jamie and Jandre are going to be on Bushwalk. We've got Jerry and um, <laughs> Rebecca in final control. And it's great to have all of you with us. We're coming to you live for our Sunset Safari and we're hoping to find some interesting little creatures just like this leopard tortoise over here. And uh, what a nice little start. He's trying to hide away from us, but we managed to spot him. Beautiful leopard tortoise. And uh, even though it looks like they do move slowly, they can actually move fairly quickly and move out of the way of danger if they need to. But I think this one is probably just resting in there. Not too sure what the reason would be for that. But don't forget everybody, we are completely live. So what we are seeing now, you are seeing back home with a few seconds delay. So send us your questions and your comments, either with the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email us questions at wildearth.tv. We'll gladly answer your questions and we love hearing from all our viewers. So this afternoon I am going to be looking for some lions again. We did find them this morning, but I'm going to head in that same area and see if we can't get them a little bit more active. This morning it was fairly cool and rainy and it's still a cool afternoon. It's about 24 degrees Celsius or about 76 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's still a lovely cool afternoon and we have had a rain prediction. Not sure if if it's going to but uh, there are some ominous clouds building off to our right and I'm sure Hat will be able to show that to you now some rather large clouds building so who knows we may get a little wet again but that's part of the safari at times look at that beautiful clouds building And um, for some of you who may be new viewers, we are situated right up in the northeastern part of South Africa in an area known as the Greater Kruger National Park in the Sabi Sands and we are on Juma Game Reserve. That's where we operate Safari Live from at the moment. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful area teeming with wildlife, all in their natural habitat, which is really, really interesting and fantastic. And what's so great about this is we take you on a safari, show you around, and try and find animals on a normal safari. So we're going to continue on our search for any wildlife. And while I do that, let's meet up with some of the other um, guides on safari. And let's go to Jamie on the bushwalk. And a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the on foot portion of the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Jandre on camera with me. And for those of you that perhaps are, before we get into what it was you were looking at, for those of you that are perhaps new to these safaris, never fear, we have a gentleman called Herbert who is a fully qualified trails guide and he goes ahead of us, helps us with tracks, helps to make sure that we're not going to go walking into anything strange. So we're very, very careful when we are out on foot in the bush, which is an important thing to be in constantly alert of our surroundings. Now, I wanted to show you something since it is a big birding day today and there's all sorts of exciting things planned. Now, just have a look at this incredible bird's nest. This is a bird's nest, or what was one. I think it was abandoned or it blew out of the marula tree, perhaps, in the storms that we've had. But look at this combination of things from no one to break it, but let's just grab this outside stick. From this material here, the old man's beard, that is quite a stickyish plant, or can be quite a sticky plant, the little bits of stem, sort of random stem, that, have, that the bird has collected, and most importantly, this stuff all around here, that ha the bird has flown back painstakingly, time after time after time after time, to wrap together its whole nest in lichen. 
lichen of course being a mixture of grow, grows off trees mainly and on rocks and playing a vital role in our ecosystem one of the oldest substances made up of bacteria and fungus working together in an example perfect example of mutualism now i've been trying desperately to work out what bird this is here's a feather can you see it there jandre yeah try hold it still try hold it still that's well if i stopped poking it it would help wouldn't it there there's a feather got it mm -hmm. so there's a feather there and despite its messy look it's actually quite a solid structure so as soon as i picked it up off the ground herbert found it for us and it's connected in the most amazing way birds are the most incredible architects and that's one of the things that we're going to be focusing on on our bushwalk over the next few hours will be to try and find you examples of the amazing way in which the birds that we see because unfortunately we can't actually add to the well we can but it's difficult for us to add to the total on bushwalk it's just that little bit more tricky when Jandre is trying to hold the camera and we're trying to look at birds far away so we'll be adding a little bit of extra tidbits about the facts about the different birds and here genre has done an amazing thing and that he's actually found the tree most likely that this bird collected the lichen from so it's come through from the spike thorn and you can see the lichen all along this branch here or along the stem here and what's very apparent to me at least is that this lichen growing here at one point probably looked a lot like this or perhaps even an even better example, if I can show you a little bit further along the branches, it looked a lot like that. Before this bird, whatever it may be, came along and peeled away with its beak, peeled away sheets of this lichen, and I'm not nearly as good as it as a bird. This lichen's pretty solid. And then, ow, oh, spike thorn. That's why it's called a spike. <laughs> That's why it's called a spike thorn. I just hit Chandra in the head. Um, that's why it's called a spike thorn. All intricately laid. There we go. I've added to the bird's nest beautifully. That was my piece. Gotcha. I know. Very artistic. And beautifully shaped. It, I think it, it must have blown out of the tree. It would have been beautifully cup shaped to hold the bird in it. I've been trying to rack my brains to figure out what it is, what bird it is that has used this nest. And I'm tossing up with fly catchers. I think it might have been a fly catcher. There is a memory stirring somewhere about which bird it is that uses lichen. So I'm going to try and think very, very hard about which bird uses lichen in its nest because that's often quite distinctive in terms of the different nests. But but while I do that, let's go over to Brent, who has got something that definitely didn't use this as a nest. Well, landing gear deployed, flaps out, coming down hot. Boom. Perfect landing from a white-backed vulture. And look what's happened, there's a hippo carcass. Now, Vim and I were here twice on the Sunrise Safari, so that hippo has died sometime during the day. Uh, the green grass not coming soon enough, the drought grabbing another victim. And no big predators here just yet to open it up, just the white back vultures. Welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Brent Smith. I have Vim on camera, and today is Big Birding Day! And of course, that is number 37 for the rusty list today. We're trying to get to over 50 species in two drives and we've got our list going and the white-backed vulture tick number 37. Remember this is a hundred percent live and uh, we are watching this unfold at this very second and if you want to send us any questions please do questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag safari live on Twitter. Can we add number 38 VM? Is there a little hooded vulture hiding amongst the white backs? Oh, wait, stop. What was that there? No, it was just two vultures together. It had a funny shaped head. No, it looks like only white back vultures so far. Now, I'm definitely going to probably swing past here after dark. Maybe the hyenas will make an appearance. Maybe this is what the hyena was whooping at on the sunrise safari. There's a bird. It's, ah, oh, it's a hardy little ibis. That's already on our list from this morning. Okay, we're gonna keep moving. I was hoping to find a fish eagle, but just as happy to find the vultures. I'm heading to one of my birding hotspots. Hopefully we're gonna have some luck while we do that. Uh, Byron has got a goose.
We do indeed have a goose. We've got a pair of geese, in fact, Egyptian geese. And that's the, here's the other one over there. So that's wonderful. Another bird to add to our list, I think. We are having our birding big day, so we're trying very, very hard to get our numbers up this afternoon from this morning. Might have a bit more luck, who knows? See what else we can find. So it's always nice to see these Egyptian geese, often around little water holes and pans. And there's a bit of a small mud wallow just in front of us. And, uh, and I think that's why these Egyptian goose are in this area. Let's see, there was a grey hornbill which flew off. I'm just trying to see if we can't find it again. I don't think we had a grey hornbill this morning. I think we had yellow billed and perhaps red billed. I'm not sure. Let's have a look. It was around here somewhere, but I think it may have disappeared already. would be wonderful to find an owl or two that would be interesting and usually you need them to call and that will help you find them these drainage lines the, these areas these thicker areas are fantastic to look for certain bird species sitting up in the big trees a lot of jackalberry trees leadwood trees around us and um, just to show you that's a beautiful jackalberry off to my left hang on let me just get a nice spot for you. there it is it's a lovely jackalberry and, and then we also have oh, what was that a little bird that flew in there and then off to my right is a beautiful big uh, sorry, the roof's in the way. We got our roof on because we worried about the rain this afternoon. But just off to my right is a big leadwood. You might be able to see it through there. That rather large tree just over there. A beautiful big leadwood tree. And you get a lot of birds sitting up in these trees. We're going to have to work on our angles a bit with the roof. So if we do have birds sitting high up in the trees, we'll definitely have to park very, very carefully. All right, so speaking about birds, Brent has another one that he'd like to show you. Well, he's just moved behind the bush. We came to this area to look for the specific species on the sunrise safari. Our, one of our seldom seen Franklin species. There we go, the Swenson's Spurfile. Now, isn't that cool? We don't see them too often, and this is one of the only areas that we do see them in. Now, the difference between a Spurfile and a Franklin, this is actually a female Swanson Spurfile. Uh, if we look at its feet, it doesn't have a really prominent sharp spur uh, that they use for fighting. Now, it does have a spur, you can see it there, but it's not nearly as big as it would be in a male. Now, very impressive spurs. And uh, the difference between a Franklin and a Spurfile is that they have a bare faces. So you can see the red skin on its face, and that is the difference between a Franklin and a Spurfile. Now we're still missing a few of the, the Franklin Spurfile family. We're missing the Natal and the Koki and the Shelleys. But hopefully we'll have some luck. But there we go. That's number 38 there. And uh, we're definitely going to come back to this area again after dark. Not so much for the birds, but might be some hyenas on that dead hippo. You never know. Okay, now this is the fun thing about birding. We got to keep our eyes peeled constantly. We got 36 species on the Sunrise Safari, which was two off the previous record. And uh, we managed to do that with the roof, so we were quite impressed with ourselves. Uh, well, let's just get for the rusty list quickly, Vim. I'm sure we'll spot a red-billed buffalo weaver in that big nest there. Can we see one? I can hear one. Let's try the, the next nests off to the left. There we go. Not a buffalo weaver in sight. Just an Egyptian. No, there's one. There's above the Egyptian goose. Red billed buffalo weaver. And uh, that goes on to the rusty list. Okay, let's keep moving. Well, hello. 
Bill. Uh, Bill is wondering what is the difference between a vulture and a buzzard and where does the Californian condor fit in? Well, Bill, a condor is actually part of the vulture family. A buzzard is a raptor, uh, so it's much more closely related to eagles. Uh, and uh, although they will feed off carrion, they do do quite a lot of their own hunting, where there is most vulture species, not all, uh, re rely almost solely on scavenging. Okay, now eyes up, binoculars at the ready bird list close by, big book of birds just in case, we're all ready for the sunset big birding day. And uh, so we're on what now, 38, 39, 39, I think we'll make it to 50, I'm almost tempted to push, push ourselves and say we should try and get to 60 rather. Now, birding in the morning is always a little bit easier, especially on a morning like we had this morning with that wonderful birding weather. Okay, now we're going to keep on checking and uh, we're also doing a bird list combining all the feeds but I, I want to keep our list going as well. It seems like Jamie has found something flying that's not feathered. Uh, I found something that was flying at some point um, and is connected in a way to a story of a bird, but we'll get into that in a moment. For now, let's discuss, just discuss what an amazing find this was on Hervey's behalf. It's an absolutely incredible thing to see. This is the first time I've ever seen it. And what you're looking at in there is most likely the eggs of something known as a stingless bee or a mapani bee. I'm pretty certain that those are the eggs, but something tragic has befallen this particular hive and just have a look at the destruction that is left behind here and all that's left is the ants moving about and finishing off a job that was probably carried out by an animal known as a honey badger Our, the honey of the stingless bees or the mapani bees is rumored to be some of the best honey in the world at least it's said to be some of the best by south africans we're very good at naming ourselves the best in the world but yeah. we but we are exactly i agree jandre we are and therefore it's a title that we've earned now this has been pushed over by, it could have fallen over, it's a dead tree that could even have fallen over, but the bees have been living in here, and we've seen the way, for those of you that have been watching this show regularly, you've seen those little entrance tunnels that the bees have constructed inside the giraffe, and this is what it would look like inside the giraffe, well obviously most of it's gone now, but this is a, to give you an idea of what it would look like inside that giraffe skull, and here we can have a look at the remainders of I think I don't think this is the honey I think this might have been the remainders of their of their hive it's quite a waxy substance it's not liquid in in the same way that we think of honey it could be it could be sort of one of their ways of storing honey but a honey badger has come through here very powdery just want to try a little bit mm. You shouldn't really, mm, it does look like pollen. You shouldn't really, um, just, just so you know, you shouldn't really go putting things into your mouth if you don't know exactly what they are or where they come from. But I'm relatively confident with this and I've only put a tiny little bit on the tip of my tongue. And also Herbie's been eating it since we first found this and he's absolutely fine. So unless he falls over in the next five minutes, I think I'm gonna be okay. A really, really interesting. It does look like pollen, doesn't it? it? Looks like pollen's been gathered. Maybe they've gathered the pollen and then dump it, and then go about um, obviously synthesizing their honey. But an absolutely fascinating sighting, and the reason I'm connecting it to birds is because, of course, the incredible sightings that we've had over the last. I would say the last two or so days, no, not so days, sorry, two or so weeks, where a honey guide, which is a type of bird, has consistently led um, the walking group, in one case it was Steph, in one case it was Byron, back to the exact same honey hive. Honey hive? Beehive. Honey hive! <laughs> the exact same a beehive each and every time. And honey guides is a type of little bird that is known to do that. It's got a wonderful call. It goes, 
and it calls not just human beings but animals as well and what will happen is it will go and call it a honey badger and somehow instinctively these animals have developed a mutualism that the honey badger knows to follow this honey guide to wherever it's located the beehive and then go and break it open and something like a honey badger with its powerful powerful jaws would have been this wood rotten wood oh see even i can do it with my powerful powerful fingers um would have been more than a match for something like a honey badger. They'd bite and claw their way into something like this. And that's all that's left of the poor Pani bee's hard work. They've abandoned it all. The ants are collecting what's left. These are the eggs, by the way. I think these are eggs. I'm relatively certain these are eggs. They, they can't really be anything else unless they, unless my Pani bees have a very unique way of storing their honey. So shame. The poor Mapani bee's beehive has been completely dismantled and who knows on the subject of birds whether or not it was in fact the fault of a honey guide. Of course, one thing we've learned over the last two weeks is if you do leave a honey um, if you do, if a honey guide does leave you to a bee, lead, goodness, lead you to a bird hide, there we go. Um, if it does lead you to a bird hide, you've got to leave some of it for it. Lead you to a beehive. Goodness, why is that so? Lead you to a beehive, lead you to a beehive, lead you to a beehive. Yes, and of course, the honey guide is one of the few creatures um, out here that is, in fact, I think it might be the only creature out here that can actually digest and break down wax. So that makes sense. Perfect example of mutualism in the bush and a wonderful little bird. Uh, you don't have to just take my word for it. Byron was one of the people that was led to the beehive. <laughs> Let's go and see if he can fill you in on a bit more of that tale. And that's right, Jamie. We did get to follow the... Oopsie. Well, it seems as though Byron has lost signal, but that's okay. We're always prepared for any eventuality in the bush, especially with a four-second delay on the bushwalk. You never know what we might be doing. We might be tap dancing down the road. Unlikely, though. No, it's, it's relatively unlikely. But while I'm tap dancing, I'm looking at a massive spider web hole. Spider web hole, also known as a hole where a spider lives. And it's a really, really fascinating spider. And this is a massive one. It is known as a baboon spider, and it is the South African equivalent of a tarantula, and it also happens to be my favorite spider. There's a couple of different species. The most common one is the horned baboon. Ah, oh, where's that thing gone? Oh, I found it. The horned baboon spider. And you can, if you sit with a long and thin blade of grass and plenty of patience, you can actually pluck out Come back! <laughs> Come back, explosion of insects! Come back to... What did Brent call it this morning? An emergence. Come back, emergence. There we go. I'm trying to find the grasshopper. I'll explain a bit more about the, the termite... <laughs> the termite mound in a moment. Oh, there, there we go. Slightly better visibility. I'm looking at a grasshopper. We were talking, Brent this morning, we were joking around because the, he described the um, after effect of the rains as sort of the emergence of the insects. And I think he used the word emergence several times as a result, uh, causing a little bit of confusion as to exactly what an emergence was. Now, this is an emergence. Things like grasshoppers. It just means all of the insects emerging after the rain. And the reason I'm pointing it out to you now is, first of all, because if I take my eye off it for one second, it's going to disappear and I'm going to lose it. Hey, little one. There you go. Well done, Chandra. Because it is so perfectly camouflaged, not on a green leaf, obviously, but when it's on the soil, it's almost impossible to see. And it knows it. And goes completely still. Unfortunately for this grasshopper, birds have the best eyesight of probably any animal out here. Uh, they see in incredible detail. Their focus is precision um, personified. That's why they're always doing the little head bob thing to the side because they're so they've they they've sort of had to biologically evolve different ways of approaching things. So they've got blind spots, but they do have the most incredible depth perception. So they've got a blind spot straight in front of them. 
unlike us because of course we are predators we're forward-facing vision but they are able by turning their head they're able to compensate for that and catch things spot things and catch things like a fast-moving grasshopper sorry I, t I started talking about the baboon spider and then I completely went on a tangent because I was trying to catch the grasshopper for you I'm not going to pull it out of her hole now, and it is a she. Um, only the females live in these holes. The, the males will run around free roaming. They'll go and they'll find a nice nook or cranny to go and hide for when it gets dark. When it's, Look here, the Mapani bees. <laughs> I, I know, Jandre, I don't know how we're going to get them on camera either. Oh, I'm sorry, little guys. They're all gathering around me. Mapani, Mapani bees are one of the most annoying, in, in a way, creatures of the bush. But they're not really. You got him on my leg. Oh, that was stupid, Jamie. That was really dumb. Hold on. There we go. There's one another two on my... Oh, they don't like movement. I'll just sit still for a second. There's one. <laughs> There's another. <laughs> Can you sort of see them fluttering around? Mm. You can sort of see them, okay. Just so people realize I'm not completely loopy. Now these Mopani bees would be ha gathering around, if, if it were a really hot day and if I were sweating a lot, which obviously I'm not doing on a cold and cloudy day, but if I were, they'd be gathering around us, sitting on our, on our skin, trying to get into our eyes, just to collect as much moisture as possible. Although on a day like today, now that it's rained, they don't have to bother too much with us. I'm jumping all over the place. I'm sorry. I just happened to notice them fluttering around and they drew my attention. Right, we're going to move on and search for more things, bird and all kinds of things. And while we do that, let's go across to Brent, who I'm sure is having an amazing time. Oh, we've just spotted some more birds in a tree. Now, it looks like there's two species which could be very, very interesting for us. So two species we haven't got yet on our list today. We've got, there we go, on the top is a batalea, and below is a tawny. Now, when you see these two birds together, it's always worth investigating. So why I say that is, well, the firstly, the batalea and tawny eagle are generally the first two to spot a kill and particularly something like a leopard or wild dog kill that's quite small that the other birds might miss. But I'm gonna go have a look there but before we do that I've heard another bird for our list. Well I'm just trying to find Battalia on my oh there we go snake eagles. Oh there we go Battalia tick and there's a very distinct coming. Now we are going to go check underneath that tree or in that area. I think there's, uh, could be, they could actually be eating impala after birth. Um, let's just go have a quick look there. I think that's what they're doing. Uh, they will actually follow the impala herds around at the moment and feast upon the afterbirth uh, that the mothers leave behind. Now there's also a black-bellied bustard somewhere around here. We can hear him calling, giving that distinct champagne pop. I thought I saw an impala through there. Now, of course, this could also be a leopard kill. Or a wild dog kill. Let's just have a look. Where are my binoculars? We're trying to look on the ground below where those two birds are. I thought I saw, I thought I saw something there. Let's have a closer inspection. I'm not sure. I thought it might be an impala lying down, but it could obviously be a kill. If it is a kill, I don't want to walk in there and, and scare it off in case it's just happened. So we haven't seen any leopard tracks, but we did hear alarm calls earlier in the day. I saw what looked to be an impala on the ground through the bush there. Well, as I said, it could be them following birthing mothers. 
It could also be a carcass. So I saw it from there and I looked through. There's a rattling cysticular alarm calling. Now to have both those birds, do you see a, what? Uh, oh, well done Vim. <laughs> I thought Vim had spotted a dead impala, but he spotted a Koki Franklin. Another one for our list. I'm so searching for a dead animal. I I'm so, I saw it lying down on the, uh, it looked like a carcass on the ground here. Maybe it wasn't dead. Maybe it's got up and run off. Hmm, interesting. But when you see those two species in a tree together, it is always really important to double check. But okay, I'm just gonna, I've still got a feeling that there's something happening here. It might be afterbirth. Oh, there's a big termite mound here. Oh, look at that, that's what it is. There's a stenbok dying, and I knew I saw something lying on the ground. That stenbok looks very ill. It, it's got an infestation of, of flies. So I, th I swear, I s look at that. That, that stenbok, he doesn't look well. Shame. So it could be that that tawny eagle and the, the battalier were waiting for it to get a bit weaker. You can see it, it looks very skinny, very sick. Those flies are incredible. Now they would have sprung out after, I mean they're on her eyeball. You see those flat ears? And as we know, normally a stenbook would be up and gone by now, especially since we're off-road. So what I saw wasn't a, a dead animal, it was a, a sick animal. Now, as I said, I thought it could be a, a leopard kill, but hopefully for the stenbook, the leopard does find it. Shame, poor little one. Okay. Well, let's move on. Let's try to find, keep with our big birding. Now, isn't that fascinating that those, those two, two species in combination, that's almost always, always, like 95% of the time, something to come check on. And in this case, as I said, I thought I saw a carcass. Um, yeah, she's not even standing. Not standing at all. I can see the wounds around her eyes from those flies. Shame. Right. It's very, very sad. But this is nature. The stenbokki will provide dinner for someone else. Okay, well, we're going to move away from this sickly stenbok and uh, go to a much healthier and happier in Kahuma Pride. And look at this, everyone who managed to find the lions again. They moved off a little bit from where they were this morning. Um, not too far, though, but luckily we did manage to spot them through the thicket. And they're all still together, which is great. And again, a big pile of lions. And there's a big male, one of the Birmingham males that uh, joined the pride. And have a look, there's actually one of the cubs moving on the termite mound. And then it's just going to lie down. <laughs> That's one, four, one, two, three, four. I can see four cubs at the moment, but but uh, I can't see to the other side of the termite mound. There's definitely a lioness or two on the other side. And I can only see three lionesses at the moment. Um, they just seem to be hiding from us a little bit. We haven't really been been able to, to count all of them uh, this morning too. It was very difficult to see all of them. 
Well, there's a few yawns coming from that lioness. She may get up and decide to either just change positions and move around. There we go. There we go. Stretch. Now she may just change her position, lie down somewhere else, or decide to move around. Ah, there we go. Just changing her position, that's all. Oh, a little sneeze from that cub. At least they're a bit more active than they were this morning. There's a bit of movement. This morning they were completely flat and not interested in moving at all, I think because of the rain. But the nice thing, and they're in this little open section, the nice thing is it's a bit, a bit cooler today, so that's why they've decided to lie out in the open. Usually, and we know in the, in the past, the lions, if it's hot, they prefer the shade. They stay in the shade and it's not always easy to see them. It was a little tricky getting in here with the roof, but we managed. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Rob from Liverpool, um, you know, we've uh, discussed how these lions have well, especially the little cubs um, have been suffering from the white muscle disease, and you wanted to know if uh, them eating that hippo that Brent found, if uh, if that would help them and be beneficial for them. Yes, most definitely. Change of diet a little bit, not just buffalo, and there's probably a lot more fat on that hippo. And uh, again, our theory, and it, I mean, it, it sounds about right, and Jamie's theory, rather, was that uh, with them eating fat, uh, they would be able to absorb um, the nutrients and proteins that they need a lot better. So they do need fat in their diet. And uh, and I, I think, I, I do think that eating other wildlife, uh, something like a hippo that has got a large fat deposit in it, fat deposits should be beneficial for these lions. Oh, look at that, the female just grooming and cleaning the little cub. And in the past, a few viewers have asked me, you know, do ticks sit on lions? And they do indeed. And one of the ways they get rid of them is by grooming and cleaning one another, just like this lioness is cleaning the cub. And look at that cub. It is loving it. Oh, it's really, really, really fantastic. All right, we're going to sit with the lions for a while, but Brent has got another bird he'd like to show you for bird day. I, mean, I told you I heard him calling before he... Wait for it. <laughs> it's so incredible. It's a male black-bellied bustard calling, trying to attract a female. Now you can see he's calling from a nice prominent perch. So, very visible up there. Black-bellied busted. They are very cool birds. Come on, you're not going to call again for us? Now, this is an area we didn't get to on the Sunrise Safari. So, we're up in the Terminalia and... Oh, here we go. <laughs> Blip. Uh, we're up in the Terminalia and, and uh, Combretum woodland and there's a whole host of bird species we didn't see this morning that we're looking through here. And one of the interesting things about a black belly busted is one of its ways of avoiding predators is to literally flatten itself to the ground, completely flat, lies down like this. And it's also capable of incredible speeds for a bird of its size. It can fly up to 65 kilometers an hour. Now, one of the other birds that I've seen a few times here that we've been looking for and going very slowly is the amethyst starling, plum-colored starling or violet back starling. All those names have been used over the last 10 years. And I've seen them in this area quite a few times. So far, no luck, but uh, we will keep, 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 keep checking. And also another good spot for Shelley's Franklin, Natal Franklin, two Franklin species we're missing. 
I think Shelley's is going to be the real challenge out of the Franklin species today. But much more shy and retiring, uh, similar in, in habits to the Koki Franklin, which we got lucky enough to see when we were following up on whatever the Battalier and uh, Tawny Eagle were looking at, which was that little Stenbock. So what we're going to do, we've got a plan, we're planning for birds. So we're going to keep through here, we're about to come out into a pile of plains. I'm hoping for some lapwings, we haven't seen any lapwings yet on the short grasses there. Uh, and then we're going to go back through a crest through mature Marula woodland and in, in dispersed with Combretum and, and uh, Bush Willow. And, uh, what we're looking for in that area is, is the African cuckoo. Now, the African cuckoos and quite a few, a lot, or well, quite a few of the other cuckoo species are great caterpillar eaters as well as the orioles. And the caterpillars are en masse on the big marulas at the moment, so it's a good place to try and find all those species. Now, we're going to keep up. Oh, what was that? No, we're going to keep up. Oh, VM's got something. Oh, well spotted VM. Now, you've got to look carefully at these guys. Now, what we want to do is, there we go, look at his gape. Now, when I refer to the gape, it's uh, the mouth. And it is another tawny eagle, so we have got him. But now, the reason I can tell you it's a tawny, not a steppe eagle, even though all those eagles look very, very similar. Let me just get a picture of them for you. Is when I refer to the gape, the tawny eagle's gape extends to the middle of the eye, which that one looks like it does. But when we look at a step eagle, for example, its gape extends beyond the eye. So there's a step eagle, also slightly darker normally. Actually, a photograph I think might show this better. Oh, there we go. So there we go, you can see how it goes all the way to the back of the eye, the gape of the mouth, whereas the tawny ends halfway. So that is indeed a tawny eagle. And so we have got him already, but still nice to teach you a little bit about how to identify the different birds. I'm really hoping that probably the most special bird that I've seen this wet season so far, for me, uh, which is not something you see too often, was the pale morph booted eagle. And who knows, maybe big birding day, they're going to make an appearance. But while we continue on our endeavors, uh, Jamie has not got a bird, but she's got something that used to belong to a bird. We are all hoping for a booted eagle, but for now we have found something, or the remains of something, probably one of the most common birds that we see, but that's not to say that it's not one of the most beautiful. Now this is not the best light, as I'm sure jean will tell you in no uncertain terms. It's not the best light for this particular feather to display it in all of its glory. It's also slightly bedraggled, but it does tell a rather unfortunate tale um, for the bird that was once the wearer of this magnificent plumage. The lilac-breasted roller feather, of course. We, we'll all remember the saga of James and the lilac-breasted roller feather. He, he put out a, a totally, totally erroneous story that I had somehow stolen his lilac-breasted roller you feather. Had. I had not. Jandre, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I had not stolen his feather. <laughs> Nikki Austin might have, but it was her hat that I was wearing. And it was her hat that had the feather in it. Now, the reason I wanted to show you <laughs> this particular site, let me try and... It's not as easy to get off the, off the termite mound, is if you have a look around here, it actually tells a, t a sort of a tale of destruction here. There's feathers all over the place, all the way around between the marula seeds and all the way around the base of this marula tree. And we'll go and we'll have a look around them and just have a, just show you. There's some here. And this is probably where the poor hapless lilac breasted roller met its end. Now I would love to collect these feathers for James perhaps, but unfortunately they haven't really, the reason by the way that James was so intent on getting these feathers was he had a deal with somebody that was going to provide him with a delicious type of coffee, if I remember correctly. Some of the sort of the more unique, one of the more unique coffees. I think if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the coffees that had been passed through, had been passed through a civet at some 
some point. So that was the deal. He wanted lilac breasted roller feathers so that he could get the coffee. And he was willing to go to almost any means. Not any means. I don't think he would have um, gone quite to, to any bad degree. But he was willing to go to all, try all sorts of things to obtain these lilac breasted roller feathers. Now, Herbie's just been telling me of a marriage ritual. Now, um, the lilac breasted roller is the unofficial, um, what's the word? Official, what do you call it, the thing? National, thank you. The unofficial national bird of Botswana. Thanks, Chandra. <laughs> Struggling there. The unofficial national bird of Botswana. The actual official bird is the Western Cattle Egret, but unfortunately they seem to disagree, which I can understand. I mean, the lilac breasted roller is pretty cool as a bird, but Herbie was just telling me about a marriage ritual where the feathers are woven together, which is a bit tricky with feathers. I mean, they're not exactly rope material, are they? And the fingers of a couple-to-be are tied together for a week. Um, so they have to be tied together for a week by the lilac-breasted roller feathers. And if it breaks, then there's a good chance that their relationship is not going to work. So they have to survive tied together for an entire week, which sounds like an absolute nightmare to me. Um, but I suppose it makes sense and to show that they can, in fact, there's a nice light blue color. They can, in fact, live together and survive together. As to what that couple does when nobody's watching in terms of just taking it off and discarding it without anybody knowing, if they come to that agreement, well, I suppose nobody would ever know. But it would be cheating, that was what it would be, but I wouldn't blame them if they did. <laughs> they sort of said, listen, I won't tell if you won't, just take it off and I mean, you do your thing and I'll do my thing for a few hours of the day. Um, but it isn't interesting and you probably have to make sure you get somebody who's really, really good at knots to tie you together. Otherwise, you would hate, it would be terrible if your marriage were to fail on the basis of one broken lilac breasted roller feather. I don't know what got this lilac breasted roller. It's been, they've been rained upon, so it's not, it's not recent. Um, it was, it could well have been living in a, in a hollow area on this marula tree and a, perhaps a gymnogene, a harrier hawk, a bird of prey, snake, we just don't know. Probably not a snake, actually. Maybe a predator. Oh, I know that Brent is very keen on seeing what birds he can find on Impala Plains, and apparently he's got there. Well, there's the rear end of a Senegal lapwing, one of the birds we specifically came out to these short grass plains to find. Now, they're incredible. They fly at night, and wherever there's a new flush of green grass, they'll land. So they actually search. Oh! Yep, yeah, flying across us. Our bow going. Was he going to land? There's a couple of them. Another one we didn't get this morning. Oh, well done. Here we go. The green wood hoopoo. That's another one of our more common ones with their scimitar shaped bill that they managed to put into crevices uh, to try and pry out any little bugs and whatnot. Oh, there we go. Oh, but that was not one we were expecting to get flying across the open air. We were expecting to get that once we got into the tree line. And let's just go with hoopoos. Just to make sure we don't forget. Green wood hoopoo. Dick. Oh, I think we're getting quite close to that 50, that magical 50. So I said we might have to push it to 60. Now, as we move out of the open area here and into the more mature woodland up ahead, and so we're hoping to find orioles, cuckoos, uh, white crowned helmet shrikes and all sorts of other things so we're trying to make sure we cover all the different sort of birding areas on Juma today and uh, we spent a lot of time around the Mwati River this morning which was very productive and it probably will get productive again a little later in in the drive and so now we're working the crests you don't find as many bird parties on the crest but when you do find a party it's generally got at least five or six species in it And uh, the birding weather has continued. So this is great birding weather. Whoa, hello, mind warp. And mind warp's wondering about the nightjar species. What time do they come out? Around dusk, normally. And do we ever see other species apart from the fiery necked? We do. Uh, the only two other species that we've recorded live have been the square-tailed nightjar and the freckled nightjar. 
Now the square-tailed nightjar we used to call generator birds. Uh, we grew up in the bush and a lot of places didn't have electricity so uh, we used to run a generator for certain hours of the day and the, the fire, oh sorry, the square-tailed nightjar goes like a generator changing pitch. We, and then the other night jar that we've seen is uh, the freckled, and it sounds like a small, irritating lap dog. Bow wow, bow wow, bow wow. And those are the three main night jar species we get here. Of course, we do get European seasonally, but they're silent in Africa. And there's a really rare chance that pennant wing night jar might come as far down, but I've never seen them in the Sabi Sands. I have seen them further north in Kruger though. No, that is a lion log. And of course, when you're moving carefully like this through the bush, there's always a chance we might encounter uh, a leopard, an elephants, buffalo, uh, and all the other fantastic creatures. But at the moment, it's only the birds up here on the crest uh, near the Balanites tree. And it looks like this particular crest, as I said, sometimes uh, there can be big gaps between the bird parties in the, in the, in the mature woodland. So we're going to speed up a little bit because I'm not hearing any signs of bird parties around us. But we are coming up towards the big Balanites tree, another little open area there. Uh, who knows what might be in store for us as we get there. Okay, you got him there, in the center of this sort of, oh, he's come out of it, I think, where is he now, he moved, and he's still there, I think, right at the back, let's just try a bit further forward maybe, it looks like a little Petronia, a got him through the gap there, Vim. Quite high. Oh, did he fly? Oh, there he goes. Darn it. Is he gonna land? Is he gonna land? Yes, he is. Don't fly, don't. Oh, you cheeky little monkey. There we go. I think we got him in a gap there. It's gonna be quite a. Is he still there? He's still there. Oh, it isn't what I thought it was. Aha, but it is another species for us. Uh, it is a member of the flycatcher family. Now, the flycatchers can be quite difficult. And um, we're just gonna have a look, there we go. And we have seen this one on the live drives before. It is the, now we were looking for an eye stripe. It doesn't have an eye stripe. So it is a spotted flycatcher. And there's another migrant who's arrived quite recently. Very streaky head is one of the signatures on there. Um, and there we go. And he's a, a voracious insectivore. There we go, a little spotted flycatcher. Uh, now that was one I wasn't expecting to get. And that's the wonderful thing about birding. You literally do not know what is around the next corner, like everything on a live African safari. Now, I'm focusing on the birds today, but if you have any questions about them, feel free. Questions at wildearth.tv via email, or you can pop us uh, a question through a Twitter by using the hashtag safari live okay before we disappear on top of that dead tree there's two birds just want to see if we can get an id on them there we go oh there we go ah oh, a gray-headed sparrow is the one on the left uh, no sorry go back there i was lying it's a female red back shrike you nearly caught me Tisk tisk. And the one on the right, ah, is a yellow throated petronia. Now, our race of yellow throated sparrows or petronias are the only race that does not have a yellow throat. Can you believe it? And uh, I'll show you quickly. So, here we go, we've got a female red back shrike and a yellow-throated petronia. So that is the, why it became named the yellow-throated petronia. And the race, that is the race Flavigula. We don't get those here, we get that one here. 
So there we go, you see the non-yellow-throated, yellow-throated sparrow. But anyway, or Petronia. Okay, well that's a lovely two other birds for this, uh, but let's go see how the big cats are doing with Byron. Ah, uh, so we're still sitting with the pride, everyone. They haven't really moved. They've readjusted a little bit. And uh, one or two of the cubs have tried to suckle and then moved off again and just changed their positions and laid down. Copy that, Steve. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Wonderful. The female playing with that little cub. It's wonderful to see how playful they can be with one another. Occasionally, even when they get a bit older, you see lionesses every now and then walking around and when they are walking and... And um, I, I think we might get lucky this afternoon. I think with it being cooler, they may get up and move around a lot sooner rather than later, I'm hoping. But uh, when they do walk around at times, you even see these lionesses being very playful and chasing and jumping with basically on one another it's wonderful to see the interaction I've seen lions go and climb trees just to get a bit of a vantage point to maybe look around and uh, and as I said jump and chase one another so they can be very playful look at that <laughs> that is very very cute that is so wonderful I hope all of you back home are enjoying this as much as I am. Paws in the air. And there's a, n a nice yawn from that female. Abu Kile, good afternoon to you. You're a new viewer. Wonderful to have you with us on Safari Live. You wanted to know how big this pride is. So Abu Kile, at the moment, this pride consists of five females and six cubs. So it's a really nice size pride. And hopefully these cubs are successful. And I'm hoping that they were... The rest of these six cubs survived to adulthood. There were originally eight. Unfortunately, two of them have died. But uh, that is survival of the fittest at times, and it is nature's way, which is not always easy to see, but it is a way of keeping the n a natural balance with these predators. And then Avukile, that male that you can see um, just off to the left, uh, that male is part of a coalition of males, and there are four of them. They form part of the coalition called the Birmingham Males, and those males patrol a huge territory within this area, and... They don't belong to a specific, a specific pride. They'll move around between different prides. And this male is one of the fathers of those cubs. And I say one of because what happens is the females often mate with the males, all the males from a coalition, just to ensure the safety of the cubs when they are born. And these brothers, these males stay together and they'll patrol the territory and keep out any threats, any other lions that might potentially try and take over their territory. And occasionally the males meet up with the pride, spend a day or two with them, and then move on again and cover their territory, mark their territory, make sure other lions don't come in. And the males may also meet up with one another. Occasionally you see two, three, or even four of them together. Oh, look at that lovely yawn. Now all this yawning and scratching and stretching is, is a good sign. If we're lucky, we might get some movement from these lions. Oh, having a good scratch. Oh. Or they just change position and lie down again. <laughs> All right. We're going to sit with these lions for a while. And while we sit here, Jamie's stretching her legs on the bushwalk. I've found one of my favorite things to witness ever. We actually followed a dung beetle here to this exact spot. <laughs> and 
you are witness to the equivalent of dung beetle wars. They are fighting with each other. Oh, did he just give up? Is that the victor? I think we might have the victor. There were three of them fighting over, actually it now looks like there were four of them, fighting over access to this dung beetle ball that he might well be the guy that bothered to roll it. He took the time to gather up the dung wherever he found it. It must have been some kind of antelope dung because I can't, maybe something small but something very fresh. And he's managed to gather up his dung and he's busy forming it into a ball. But, oh, he, there was another one that nearly came in for a landing. In fact, it might still. It's circling the area. They're incredible. Their ability to find fresh dung is truly phenomenal. But what you just saw was a fight between, because dung beetles are industrious little creatures, but not always. Sometimes, sometimes they are not really above actually fighting off. So let's say one male dung beetle went to all of the fuss of rolling a dung ball. They are not above attempting to steal it from him, which is why he has to use that powerful, oh, this one's coming back in. There's one coming back, it's coming back. Oh, we might see it again. Bzzz, the sound of them in flight. Oh, he is, he's challenging once again. <laughs> my property. Go away. <laughs> and the intruder retreats with dignity not intact. He has just had a fight over a ball of dung and lost. A day in the life of a male dung beetle. Now if you are just joining us and perhaps are wondering what these dung beetles are doing, they are rolling a food ball or potentially an egg ball. Ball. It's such a pity it's under this tree because poor Jandre has to keep ducking and to avoid getting the antenna caught in its branches. Um, but he essentially what a male dung beetle does is he rolls a ball of dung and he finds himself a lady friend who looks at this ball of dung and thinks, oh, I'd quite like to lay my eggs in there because that will provide some good food for my offspring. Uh, she will go and sit on the dung ball, they'll go off, they will mate, and they will bury the dung ball, dung ball with their eggs inside of it. So uh, when their babies hatch, they have a ready-made source of food. Now, right now, this dung beetle is, he still hasn't quite fully formed the perfect sphere just yet. He's actually still in that process, and I don't blame him. He was well and truly interrupted by the four challengers. And you are looking at the champion of them all. He managed to fight off four errant male dung beetles intent upon stealing his property and won. Oh, hold on, hold on. Are you coming for me now? Are you coming for me? Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> it's okay, it's all right. Now, Natasha in London, you want to know if a dung beetle, as he goes about cleaning himself, oh, he's about, might go back. You want to know if a dung beetle has a certain lifespan. Natasha, as far as I know, most of them are just, they only live for about a year. Do you know of any that live longer than a year? I think they only live for, oh, they're back. Fight, fight. Get off, go away. And he wins once again. Which is impressive because the challenger was a lot larger than him. <laughs> Natasha, as far as I know, all of the dung beetle live for about, uh, live for only a year. Once they've laid their eggs, their life cycle is complete and they will die. Like a great deal of insects out here, a great, a great number of different insects out here, they generally have relatively short lifespans. You get exceptions in the case of things like arthropods, like um, scorpions and spiders and certain beetles but the dung beetles are not among them. Right, now what? Have you finished packing it? He's now f focusing on the opposite side. He's rolled in, Chandra, do you wanna come here for a second? He's rolled another dung beetle into, oh, you can't, the branches. He's rolled another dung beetle into the into the ball of dung. A little ball, a little dung beetle. <laughs> Sorry, Chandra, no, I don't know if you're gonna be able to, let me try. And it keeps trying to get out and he keeps packing it. Oh, it got out. 
Oh, it was just another beetle. He keeps packing them back in. Every time they try and get out, there's a whole load of little bugs in here. Little beetles, not bugs, sorry. Little beetles. And he keeps trying, every time they try and get out, he packs them back in again and he shoves the, the dung back on top of their heads. Now he's got his work cut out for him. This is quite the slope that he's got to push up against. Which way is he going to go? If, it, if he were to take any advice from me, I would tell him to go that way. Uh, and, and maybe not try and get up the slope. But they're amazingly strong. Incredibly strong. And they have a unique way of pushing their dung ball. They stand on their head and push with their front feet. Backwards. And then every now and again they pop up onto the dung ball. And they look around where they are. And then they go back down head first and off they roll. You can see he's furiously packing with his feet. We've seen the females do this a few times. Oh, but the, the challengers hasn't, only one challenger is left. And I don't know if that's just because he hasn't bothered to fly away yet or if he's planning another ambush. Oh, 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 <laughs> see, he did, go, he did go for the massive slope. Yes, that's a better way. Oh, back towards the challenger. No, he's gonna, he's still, he's intent on going this direction. Uh-oh. See how incredible this is? That is such an incline. It's a really steep incline. Better move out of his way. <laughs> oh, Mr. Dung Beetle, there is a hole, a very large hole, that I, oh no, oh no, what happened there? He got, he got launched off the, oh dear, <laughs> launched off the dung beetle by a springy stick and a dung ball. There he goes, there he goes, there he goes, there he goes. Bravo, I think. I don't know, he's just disappeared down the slope. Yes, absolutely, James. In Ohio, you say that you've noticed that they have a shovel-type face and front and back front. Where's he gone? I'm gonna try to find him. Um, yes, absolutely, it's to help them shovel dung. They are perfectly designed for what it is they do. They, of course, form a very important part of this ecosystem. They're nature's rubbish collectors quite literally. Um, and my dad always used to joke that they were his favorite animals. Um, maybe it wasn't a joke, maybe it was serious. He always used to say they were his favorite. So as our dung beetle, our dung beetle may be a genius or it may be the silliest dung beetle in the world. That looked like it was a really simple way to go. Okay, while well, our dung beetle goes about his business, let's go back over to Brent. No, no. A little bit lower, a little bit lower. Sorry, guys. We're just trying to get a really bird, a bird we don't see very often. He's there. It's called a yellow-bellied aeromomola. Oh, there he is. Flip out. There it is. Stay in the open for a little bit. Good little aeromomola. Now that could be a really good bird for a lot of your lists. I don't think it's one a lot of you have. It is called a yellow-bellied aeromomola. Oh, off it goes. Now I know the light wasn't too bad, so I do have a picture of him ready. And we've been trying to get that guy on camera for an age. I don't know if it could be. Let me know. Is this the first yellow-bellied aeromomola we've ever had on camera? Uh, if it is, please let me know. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. But that is a really good tick. Now, we hear them often. Save onto the list. That's number 49 for the rusty list. And I'm hoping number 50 is in this little scrap of bush here. Uh, it's one of our more common ones we haven't seen. I'm just trying to see there disappeared if they flew off while we were hunting aeromomolas. They might have escaped the little wax spills. Looks like they have. But I really I really think I think the yellow bellied aeromomola could be a really good bird for a lot of your lists. There in the marula. There. Here we go. A common scimitar bull. Another one we do see quite regularly, but one we haven't popped on camera today for Big Birding Day. That's a nice one. The common scimitar bull. So like the wood hoopoos, that, well, it's got even more of a scimitar-shaped uh, beak. Oh, oh. There we go. Oh, well spotted, Vim. Ah, a crumbic. Oh, Vim's on fire today. 
See, this is what happens when we find a party in the mature woodland. As I said, you quite often get a lot of little, a lot more species in uh, these these bird parties. Even though you have to travel sometimes quite far between the two. And that is a little long-billed crombeck hopping around there. That is number 50! Yes, Fiam! 50 in two drives! Oh, yeah, high-fiving, pumping, I wasn't sure what to do, I'm just so thrilled. Now, as I said, I think we're gonna get to 50 quite easily, just on Rusty, so we're obviously over with uh, Jamie and, and Byron included. Now, can we get to 60? Well, we'll just keep going as much as we can. VM has been on fire with the camera because the birds are, and especially those little ones like Eromomolas. Isn't that a different one? Say everyone at home, go one, two, three, Eromomola. Eromomola. And we haven't even seen one woodpecker today. I thought I saw one fly across, flash across as I said that. Now, of course, a birding big day is a, a, quite a big deal all over the world. Uh, I think it's on different days depending on where you are in the world. And in South Africa, it's generally at the beginning of the rainy season when a lot of the migrants come. And uh, you can enter teams and win prizes and all money raised uh, goes towards bird conservation in Southern Africa. It's run by BirdLife South Africa. So, uh, great little cause, birding big day. So apparently the Aeromomola was a new one for lots of people. That makes me very happy. It's definitely the first time I've put one on camera. Vim, have you ever put an Aeromomola on camera? And Vim hasn't. So, well, maybe it's a first for everyone. Uh, that would be wonderful, because I'm pretty sure uh, the Sterling's Bard Ren Warbler this morning was definitely a first on camera. So, birding big day, two firsts on camera. I think that's going pretty well. Who knows, maybe we can get a third, a fourth, a fifth. Okay, maybe I'm being a little bit over optimistic, but I am an optimist. I was a little and I was going to say I'm an opportunist at heart. No, I'm not an opportunist. I'm an optimistic at heart. So let's carry on. And uh, to make them happy, hopefully while we bird, we might find Queen Karula. Temperature has ducked down a few degrees. Oh, that was close. Incoming dung beetle. Hi, Joan. Now, Joan has posed something very strange. She says she's never seen a bull bull on drive, but never been to an African country without them. Well, well Joan, we actually are. We do have bull bulls. I'm surprised. Well, I will have to go look for one now, Joan. That's one that's completely slipped my mind today. Uh, but we do get bull bulls and green bulls and brown bulls, strangely enough. Okay, there's a great go away bird alarm calling. Now, for me, that sounds like it's a terrestrial predator, not a avian predator. Now, this is an area the Krula does like to move through. So I'm gonna do a loop around this block uh, and see if we can find something. I'll just keep a careful look. Because birds sit high, they can often alarm call from from quite a distance. Hi, Aaron. Uh, Aaron is wondering, do we get the African black duck in the Sabi Sands? We do indeed, Aaron, but uh, only on the rivers, really, not so much up here. Now, if we get enough rain, we might get some teals, uh, red bull teals passing through on the water holes, but uh, the black duck uh, prefers rivers and flowing rivers. Okay, so we just wanna... Ooh, 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 what was that? That looked very interesting. Slowly, slowly, don't fly any... Oh, darn it. it. Flew away, whatever it was. I didn't get a chance to see it. I just saw a flash of red. Could have been a paradise flycatcher. 
Now, who knows, is our birding adventure going to lead us to the Queen of Juma? Only time will tell. So I'm just trying to see if I can see where those go-away birds were perched, but they were alarm calling down in the drainage there. Safari Dean says, with all the birds back, do we even need an alarm cock in the mornings? Well, believe it or not, Safari Dean, we beat the birds. Uh, we're up before them. Uh, at the moment, we're up, well, uh, up at about quarter to, quarter, quarter to four in the morning. So we, we beat the birds. They only start calling after we've been up for about half an hour or so. Uh, <laughs> the joys of living in the African bush, I wouldn't want it any other way. But uh, we're gonna keep on our search for possibly a leopard, possibly some more bird species while we do that. And let's go see how the incredible Inkahumas are doing with Byron. So they're starting to wake up a little bit more, Brent. Um, more heads up, more cleaning and grooming. So all of this is good signs for us. Even the male is sitting with his head up now. And uh, I say a good sign because it would just be wonderful to have them get up and move around a bit hopefully not further into the thicket because then i don't think we'll be able to follow them but we're not far from buffles hook dam so maybe they decide they'd like a drink of water and they head down there that would make a wonderful wonderful shot so i'm hoping that's my I hope I wouldn't say prediction because I don't want to predict something like that because if it doesn't happen then <laughs> then you'll all be really upset with me so I'm hoping that's what they do. Oh, watch a yawn. Ah, good. Now when they're yawning they, they're doing that to try and fill them, their bodies with more oxygen and it is a sign that they may be waking up looking to move around a little bit. Occasionally lions will yawn and stretch and then just get up and change their positions and lie somewhere else or they decide okay it's time to get up and start moving so who knows, who knows. We, but we are going to be patient and that's one of the things that I think is probably the most important while being in the bush and on safari is having patience, sitting and enjoying animals and viewing them because things happen when you least expect it. And if you just drive in and uh, and we, we call it just ticking off the animals, so if you just drive in, view them, tick them off that you've seen them and move on, you often miss the real behavior and interaction so it's important to try and sit and be patient and things will happen for you that's how I feel and I feel very strongly about that Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the name properly, but I think it's Chanis. You wanted to know if a uh, two male lions will. Uh, Tennis, I apologise. So Tennis, you wanted to know if two male lions would mate with a single lion from the same pride? Yes, definitely. And what would happen is. Um, the one male and most likely the slightly more dominant one he will get to mate first with the lioness and i say the more dominant one even within a coalition there is a hierarchy one that would be more dominant than the others he'd most likely get to mate first with the lioness and once he's finished and moved moved on the lioness may then mate with one of the other males and again the reason for that is possibly ensure that she does fall pregnant and uh, the other reason is that then she ensures the cub safety that all the males think those cubs belong to them and uh, and they will then protect them excuse me a second uh, Stephen affirmative I'm still here uh, they just in the block directly west of of um, Buffalo's Hook Dam best approach you'll see the vehicle tracks just in the, on the southwestern corner of the dam wall and you can just you might even get my visual from there
Copy that. So we're just getting some other guests in to see the lions. And that's a wonderful thing with us being on radio and other people who are out on safari here. They get to see these animals live and spend time with them. So it's nice that we help each other find the animals and, and the people on safari do get to enjoy them. See a lot of grooming going on, a lot of cleaning, scratching. Ah, oh. uh, Glynis, um, that is a very keen ear you have. You could hear a woodpecker knocking while I was speaking. And you're 100% correct, it is a woodpecker. And I'll show you which one it is. Um, I can't see it, it's a little bit far away, but it is a bearded woodpecker. And the reason I know that is because that knocking sound that it's doing, it's actually a territorial call. So it knocks on a dry piece of wood, and that is its territorial call to let other birds know this is its, its territory and that they should stay out of it. So let me show you what it looks like. <coughs> Um, well, let me first, sorry, let me first show you, that's what it looks like in the box, and you've got that beautiful, those black markings on the side of the cheek and under the throat, and that red, uh, red nape, you could call it, or the top of the, top of the head, um, and then this is what the bird looks like. So that's the bearded woodpecker, and that's the little woodpecker making all that noise that you could hear knocking glints. That's nice. I'm glad you... Unfortunately, we couldn't see it. It was a little bit far. Um, okay, we're going to sit with these lines a little bit longer. I'm going to be patient. I don't want to move anywhere. But let's head back to Jamie on the bushwalk and see what she's got. And just have a look at the incredible, well, first of all, the interesting exoskeleton of the spider and then the incredible beauty of this particular tree, which is a tree that we don't often stop at, but it's known as a caterpillar pod bush or a caterpillar bush. And it's one of those tricky ones to find information on. The reason that it's called a caterpillar bush is because it has seeds that look like caterpillars believe it or not and I'll show you when they do actually start to fruit but for now it's got these incredibly beautiful purple flowers I think they're actually I don't think I've ever seen a flowering caterpillar bush so I'm actually quite excited this is the first for me and I think if I remember correctly the, the Latin name is Omocarpum trichocarpum or something along those lines. So there you go. It was one of the first ever trees I learned because it amused me tremendously that the fact that they had seeds and they basically look like dangling hairy caterpillars. They're about this long and they're fluffy and they dangle from the tree and they look like hairy caterpillars. Isn't this beautiful though? An absolutely lovely tree. Uh, that's basically all I have to tell you about it really. It's a pretty tree. Um, Black rhino love them, but not that we're going to see. Uh, this is definitely not an area for black rhinoceros, but black rhino love them. They often munch them. I actually did for a couple of weeks in an undisclosed place in an undisclosed time. I followed black rhino around uh, for weeks on end, watching what they were feeding on. And there was a, but at times it was a little bit scary because one foot, because they, were, they weren't comfortable with vehicles at all. So we were sort of creeping around watching what they were eating and then going around and recording exactly what it was they were feeding on. But it's very easy, just getting distracted now, but it's very easy to see where a black rhino has been feeding because they have a very specific way of biting off branches. They bite it off at an exact 45 degree angle. And it's very clear. You can go up to raisin bushes, you can go up to anything that they happen to, uh, red thorn acacias they really like. And you look at the way that they've been eating and it's a perfect, perfect 45 degree angle. And when you dig through their dung, which by the way is my favorite smell in the bush, if you dig through their dung, 
you find these short pieces of wood or stick that have perfect angles on either end of them and they're usually about that long it's very easily identifiable now I want to show you something I want to show you the hazards of living in the bush and I'm going to try and work out how I'm going to do this Jean Ray knows all about them we all know all about them you'll have to excuse my incredible socks but look here Look at what's, do you want me to get higher there, jean <laughs> It's a bit of a tricky one. Look at what is on my trousers. And now, to give you a sense of scale as to what is on my trousers, you'll notice that they're moving. Let me put my finger next to them. Now those are crawling all over us and they are known as pepper ticks. Pepper ticks are the larval stage of ticks and they love to go for the sock line, the trouser line and the underwear line or the top part of your belt or any other soft warm place that they can find and I promise you when they bite you it is the most itchy thing in the world. Now imagine trying to find, it's just the one that will escape me when I get back and go and sweep off my pants or sweep off my trousers. It'll be the one that bites me. Now imagine being as freckly as we get Yet, being out here in the sun all day, especially me with sort of Scottish-Irish heritage. Imagine trying to find a pepper tick in amongst those freckles. And what it does is it crawls all over the place and it bites and it's incredibly, incredibly itchy. I'm going to go and have a quick sweep off <laughs> over there in the corner while I do that. Let's see what else is out there. The hunt for the birds continue. Vim has got, there we go, a beautiful little yellow fronted canary. Uh, number 51. Uh, wonderful little seed eaters. Oh, we've been stalking them for a while. They're, they're proving quite difficult. Oh, there comes one flying in. Oh, but they're hiding in all the, the thickets here. There we go, there we go. Great camera work, Vim. There's a little canary in there somewhere. There he is. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna try and go back a little bit, but they are quite quick. Oh, and there's a wax ball. Did you see the wax ball? There we go, well done, VM. Oh no, that didn't count, where'd he go? Oh, he's still there, he's just. You got him there? He's behind the stump. Naughty wax bowl. Where did you go? Because that definitely didn't count. There he is, on the ground, behind the stump. There we go, the little powder blue wax bowls. Another one of the beautiful little seed eaters. They are so, so pretty. Now, theoretically we get a few other wax species here, but I've never seen them. I've only ever seen the blue wax ball in the northern Sabi sands. Oh, off he goes. Now, the real treat to see um, would be the violet eared wax bull. And um, I've actually seen them a couple of times uh, in the southern Sabi sand. But wouldn't it be a treat to see one of these here? I think if we're going to see them, it's going to be on Cheetah Plains. Uh, the violet eared wax bull. Isn't that beautiful? But I haven't ever seen one in the north. We're going to continue. And we're building, building nicely, steadily now. We're still missing orange-breasted bush shrike, grey-headed bush shrike, Natal Franklin, Shelley's Franklin, brown-hooded kingfisher, striped kingfisher. So we, we still are missing a few of the more oh, black-headed oriole, uh, and of course the European golden oriole, which I've seen around, but we haven't managed to get on camera yet. So there's still quite a few other birds we can co collect and to add to our birding big day list. Now is that wonderfully funny movie? I quite enjoyed it, but I am a bird watcher. I'm not sure if non-bird watchers enjoyed it. I think it was called A Big Year. 
uh, with Jack Black and Owen Wilson about birding. And uh, I do take my birding quite seriously, but definitely not that seriously. Okay. Now we're going to head down along the edge of this little river system and hoping we're going to find some more birds. Hello Joachim from Germany is wondering what European bird species. Oh Joachim, I'll get back to you in a second. There's a buzzard flying. Is he gonna land? No! Where did it go, Pim? Did he keep going? Okay, tell me, forward, back, stop. Vim spotted him, back. Well done, Vim. Is it a buzzard? Oh no! Turn, 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 turn for me. It looks to me. No, no that's I you to turn, not show me your bottom. It looks maybe, possibly, to be a juvenile, yes, there we go, juvenile African hawk eagle. Uh, we haven't, definitely haven't got them yet. Well, there we go, isn't that exciting? African hawk eagle, a juvenile. Uh, and from the sound of things, he was trying to hunt dwarf mongoose who are complaining and uh, really, really alarm calling now. Juvenile African hawk eagle. Wonderful. Joaquim, don't worry, I haven't forgot about you. <laughs> Just couldn't resist the African hawk eagle. Uh, now, Joaquim is asking, what European species can we expect to see here? Uh, barn swallows, European rollers, uh, European beaters, we actually saw on the sunrise safari. Uh, what other species that will come? Uh, Redback shrike, uh, we've, which we've also seen today. I'm trying to rack my brains. Now, a lot of our raptors, like Warburgs, no, they're further down, not from Europe. Uh, steppe eagles from Russia, Mongolia. Steppe buzzards, Russia, Mongolia. Um, lesser spotted eagles, India. Hmm. Uh, give me a second, I will try to remember some more, but there's definitely uh, those, those, those few. Okay, we're going to head now into the area of the Mawati riverbed. Maybe we're going to get some of those birds that are missing, like orioles and bush strikes. And while we do that, uh, let's go see how Jamie's romp on foot is going. Uh, speaking of the various birds, remember earlier I showed you the pepper tick? Let me try and keep this guy. He doesn't want to really keep still. But this is what a pepper tick looks like. I've moved it onto my hand just to give you a slightly better idea. And this is a type of tick that would most definitely be found on birds. They love birds. If they get picked up whenever the bird lands, they'll hop on. I think I've walked through a pepper tick nest, with them, all of them gathered together around one particular plant. But that gives you a really nice idea as to just how small they truly are. And I'm not a huge fan, I have to be honest. I, I don't know whether or not that came across all that clearly, but I'm actually really not a huge fan of these pepper ticks. Um, I, I feel as though we have enough ticks in the world and I don't need you on me, thank you. And the rest of you can go as well. I don't understand that I can feel them already psychosomatically of course because you actually don't feel the initial bite but I can feel them already crawling in my socks and it's make, making me want to rip my socks off and sort of tear them off and go and scrub my feet and get rid of them they always bite in between the toes as well sorry I just want to go and see something that I think Herbert has found I'm going to go start walking across in that direction whilst trying to ignore you know when you start you start to think about itchy things all over you and you're really uncomfortable sorry I'm just thinking or trying to think from David and Napa you want to know why are the flowers here often purple or usually purple are they 
Or is it just that we stop and we show you purple flowers more frequently? I'm not 100% sure, David. And we get lots of yellows, we get lots of blue, um, what's the other colors? White, yellow, <laughs> pink. Thanks, Chandra. Chandra is whispering colors to me. It's the birding. I've got, Chandra described it earlier, I've got bird brain. Clearly, I've got bird brain this afternoon. You know, they come in lots of different colors. I don't think there's a particular skew in the direction of purple flowers, to be honest. I, I can't think of any that would outnumber it. I actually think there's probably more reddish orange ones than there are necessarily purple ones. I want to go and see what Herbert has... Ah! I see what Herbert has found. <laughs> ah, there it is. I nearly lost what Herbert had found. But I found it once again. Perfectly camouflaged in the form of a grasshopper that looks like a leaf blade. Perfectly like a leaf blade. And that's one of the wonderful things that these bushwalks are really useful for, is giving you a perspective into the lives of these creatures and just how magical the camouflage is at an insect level. You want to come onto my hat or are you too scared? No, you're going to jump. Oh, those magnificently powerful back legs of his built like springs to launch them into the air and they can launch themselves many times the height of their bodies or many times the length of their bodies and bound off in a sort of startle display. So they wait right until the last moment. They rely on their camouflage right up until the moment that they realize they've been seen. And then they go to there. That one had John Ray fooled for a second. He took his eyes off it for a moment and it was gone. Yeah. And no, he's relaxed a little bit around us. He's decided that jumping's not working because we're keeping track of him. Maybe if he keeps still. Now that's a, a mantid or a grasshopper that would most definitely, sorry, not a mantid, a grasshopper. Um, that would most definitely be a snack food for any one of a number of different birds. Now, speaking of birds, we've got a patch here that we're looking at, and it's this is now dry, this is before the rain that this bird has come here, but it's come and had a little dirt bath in this impression in the ground. You missed your impression of a dirt bath. You missed, would you like it again? Dirt bath. I mean, imagine I had feathers and was in dirt and was bathing. <laughs> this, is, this is the track of a bird having a dirt bath and having a marvelous time doing it, presumably. Oh, speaking of our great birder, let's go across to Brent to see what he has. Well, look at this. This is not something you see. We've got three male plum-colored starlings or amethyst starlings, violent back starlings, all fighting for the attentions of one very drab female who's just above them. There she is. Look at that. So there's the female. <laughs> oh, he got a piece of feather from that guy. So there's the female, the very gray, stripy bird, and they're the males who's fighting over her attentions. Oh, look, there's that one male. While those two are focused, he's trying to sneak in there. Sneaky boy. So we were looking for them miles away. We definitely weren't expecting to find them here, but what a bonus. Not one, but four. And that's number 55. Isn't that beautiful? Is the Oriole still there, Vim? Yeah, he's gone. No, oh, darn it. Uh, we had a choice between the black-headed Oriole or those amethyst starlings. Oh, let's have a look. I'm just checking for there's a black-headed Oriole who was... Oh, there he is. Yay! Not, not the European, but we'll take the black-headed for now. I'm really excited to get the first European golden Oriole on camera. Oh, he looks like he's very cold and miserable and he's found himself a good spot uh, hidden in the leaves there. The black-headed oriole. 
Now, there seems to be a lot of birds through this area. Well, let's just go back to that. You see that terminalia there? Let's see what birds are in that at the top left hand side of it. There we go, two birds there. Uh, it's uh, the female plum colored starling and a yellow fronted canary. So there, there's actually a nice view of the female, sorry, Vim, of the female um, violet back starling. You can see quite dull and drab in comparison to those shiny boys. But all the boys are arguing over her. Okay. Oh, this is a very productive little spot. Oriole, starling. Hi, Renee. Renee is wondering, do we have ostriches in the Sabi Sands? Indeed we do. Not very common though. Oh, top of the knob thorn. Is, which sunbird is it? No, it's not a sunbird. It's a red back shrike, uh, which we have, and uh, a starling. I've heard a sunbird though. Is he not up there somewhere? Just trying to listen. Sorry, Renee. Uh, we do. Um, I've only ever seen ostriches on Juma once. We normally see them more often on uh, in the south and east of our Travis on Cheetah Plains. But even then, it, it is quite unusual to see them. Okay. Slowly, slowly through here. Now, this is a great birding area because we got on the edge, we've got the river, and we've got the Terminalia and Cabritum Woodland. So lots of different birds we might find here. Now we've seen quite a few species we didn't see this morning. They might not have been as active in the wet and uh, they needed a little dry off before they decided to become active. So our plan is we slowly move our way up the edge of the Mawati River here to Spaghetti Junction, which is a junction of a whole bunch of roads. We're going to drop into the riverbed and then we're going to head back south in the riverbed, uh, seeing if we can pick up any lovely birds there. Uh, we might take a swing past the Sticks Pride, see what's happening there, if they've moved or not. I don't know if anyone's checked on them yet, but I've, I'm pretty convinced they're probably still very flat. Hi James. James is wondering what are the chances of seeing a five finch? Pretty good. Uh, they're around. Uh, they're not as active in this weather. A lot of your little seed eaters like the wax balls as well uh, and your petillias are not as active in this cool weather. But there's always a chance they do occur here. Okay. A little bit of open grassland here, so we might find some other critters. What's that up ahead? I don't know. Ooh, it sounds like there's a bird party happening on the edge of the river. And we're heading right into that area where there's lots of calling. Hi, Sarah. Now, Sarah is wondering, do we ever see giant kingfishers here? We did when there was a lot more water. We might see them again uh, once the, the water fills up if we get more rain. Where are you hiding? Sounds like he's on that Pelter Forum. No, there he is. That's what we're looking for. You see him there? Right on the edge of this thicket there. There we go. Now, a lovely, beautiful call. Oops. Oh, sorry, Vim got stuck on a light. There we go. He's just moved it out of the way. 
Now, that bird will forever remind me of James Henry. It is his favorite bird. It is the white-browed scrub robin. You can hear that beautiful robin's call. Now, they're also incredible mimics, and they can mimic lots of different bird calls as well. And quite nice that he's sitting quite open and prominently calling. Quite often, they're a skulking species, which means they flitter and around in the thickets. They've got a very, very varied diet, but almost all invertebrates. And uh, interestingly enough, depending on the time of the year, about 68% of a scrub robin's diet is made up of termites. And then when the termites aren't so prominent on the surface, 66% during the dry season is made up of ants. They sometimes will also feed off some nectar, but that's quite unusual. But it is a beautiful call, the white-browed scrub robin, uh, James's favorite bird. Quick leg to Jamie! We are going to try our, I see you, I see you, I see you. No, it's in there. Is it still there? Yeah. Is it still in that combretum? In that combretum. Okay, we're going to try and sneak up on it. Sorry for the rushed start and dragging you away from Brent. Um, we're trying to get that the, the, the pearl the, spotted the, owl. Yeah, bending on the brain that bends. The, the brain to the right that bends. The branch to the right that bends over this side. Yeah, over this side, yeah. Am I being blind, Jandre? Uh, no, I'm also blind. The one on the left-hand side, oh, there, there he There he goes. Okay, let's go around, I see him now. He's in the knob thorn. <laughs> We're trying to get one of the little owls on camera. It's one of the ones that Brent hasn't managed. Can you see him there, Jandre? It's a really difficult one. I think it might be, I think. You got it, you got it. Well done, Jandre. Jandre's managed to get it on camera. Well done, Herbie, as well. It flew down and it obviously grabbed an insect and the drongo started mobbing it. So there you go, a pearl spotted owl to add to our list of birds that we've been gathering over the entire day. I feel like I've made a very valuable contribution. I haven't managed to contribute any other birds. So I'm very... very really thrilled that we managed to get the pearl spot owl. I say we, uh, it was very much a joint, a team effort. I'm going to try and just see what it looks like around. Jandre, I will come back to you in a second. I'm just trying to see if we can get a slightly clearer view of what it looks like. <laughs> Herbert's telling me to go come and have a look this side. Can you see it through here? Aha. Yeah. Uh -huh. Gonna be a tricky one. Do you want a shoulder, Jandre? Would that help? Very good. It is, if you look at that through there, just under the marula, top marula branch, you'll be able to see him. You might have to duck a little to see him. I'm hoping he might call as well. That characteristic pearl spotted owl call. No. Right at the top. You'll be able to see. Still in the knob thorn. Still in the knob thorn and underneath that marula branch, that one that goes across like this. Mm. Yeah, got him. You got him. Whoopsie, sorry. In my excitement and bowling Jandre over, which isn't very helpful when he's trying to remain steady. Well done, everybody. A <laughs> pearl spotted owlet on camera. The one that makes that beautiful whistling call. go Anita you wanted to hear the call of the pearl spotted owl I don't necessarily do it as well as some of our, I've oh, good 
goodness, some of the other imitators that I have heard um, over the years, but that is the call or the whistle of the pearl spotted owl. And what you often find, the drongos were actually mobbing it as it landed, and chasing it away. A forktail drongo is actually roughly the size of a pearl spotted owl, at least in terms of height. And what you'll often find is that the forktail drongos will imitate the call of the pearl spotted owlet as well, as a way of essentially, one of the reasons that's put forward as a reason to why they do it is to essentially intimidate. Sorry, I'm getting very chilly all of a sudden. One of the reasons why they in attempt to intimidate other pearl spotted owls by being able to whistle the call and whistle it louder than the pearl spotted owlets can. So essentially trying to scare them away. They say they do the same thing with cuckoos. I find it a little hard to believe. Um, I think that the birds are so attuned to their own personal calls, they've got such a level of way or a way of detecting the nuances between the various calls that I actually really don't think that they can't tell the difference between one or another. Just my opinion. I think that they can very easily tell the difference between an, an actual pearl spotted owl and a drongo imitating one. Jay, you were wondering on the subject of birds, just in general, uh, it was something much, much larger and actually quite, to be honest, a little bit uglier than a pearl spotted owlet. You're saying we haven't seen a marabou stalk for a while recently, and do they leave? Sorry, I'm trying to catch an emergence. It just amuses me that Brent used that as a noun. Sorry, Jay. Give me one second. I've lost it. Ha ha. Found it. <laughs> Shame. It's okay. It's all right. Here we go. Here we go. It's okay, buddy. Jay, you wanted to know while I collect your surprise, <laughs> emergence, you wanted to know whether or not, oh dear, he's on my shoe. That'll do. Rather than my hand, it'll do on my shoe. I wanted to show you the red. That's what I'm trying to... Okay, I give up. He's <laughs> there. No, where is he? There. <laughs> there. I'm trying to show you the flash coloration on the grasshopper, but I can't do that. <laughs> Just watch very closely, and I will finish Jay's question. Just watch for the red. You see the red there? Not really. One more time. You ready? Watch for the red. Oh, as, as it refuses to jump. Right, Jay, just quickly to finish off your question. No, the marabous don't necessarily, they don't migrate, but they do move from different areas where there is a good food for them to eat. And they are scavengers. There's been plenty here, but maybe they've just been flocking somewhere else. Oh, speaking of course of the reasons for some of the, well one of the reasons why the scavengers have been so well fed over the last few months, let's go across to Byron and some lion cubs. And have a look at this, these cubs have woken up and they're starting to move around and this one's climbing the tree, look at that. So anybody who says lions don't climb trees, you are mistaken, they do indeed, not very well though. But as you can see, but they do indeed climb trees, not not quite like a leopard, however. But they're very, very active. The um, females have just moved off, unfortunately. They've moved a little bit further in through the thicket, but these cubs are providing us with a lot of entertainment. And they all seem to be trying to climb this tree, possibly stretching and cleaning their claws a bit. Now, I know a lot of viewers have been concerned about the the health condition of these cubs. And I was saying earlier that uh, this is the first time in about two weeks or three weeks that I've seen these cubs so playful and active again. And they've been chasing one another around for about 10 minutes now, jumping, pouncing. So they're looking very, very healthy. And those who were concerned about the white muscle disease that they had, it appears as if it's all good news for now. I, again, I don't want to jinx anything um, or, or promise full recovery, but it does appear as if they're doing very, very well. All six cubs are here. <laughs> and they are doing well. So that is very good news for us. And 
Heather, you want to know how long lion cubs stay with their mothers. <clears throat> so Heather, generally what happens with the females, the female cubs, they will stay within the pride and just allow the pride to to grow in size and those lioness those young lionesses will then eventually help the pride hunt and hopefully create a very successful pride with more lions the males however may get pushed out by the dominant males um, or if they feel that there's in competition or other new males coming in those males would potentially leave the pride and move on um, and that's usually at the age of about three or four um, if not if not a bit later uh, maybe five generally generally speaking lions young male lions will start coming into their own and trying to challenge for dominance and territory at the age of about five or six if there's a coalition or a group of them then they may do that uh, from that age and potentially chase out older lions and possibly try and set up a territory for themselves for themselves in another area and mate with females from a different pride so it, it's it's again there's no um, set rule on when young males will get pushed out or if young females get pushed out I have seen I've seen situations where a pride of lions, or, or um, a pride of lions, was actually um, a very successful pride that had four females, and those four females gave birth to eight cubs between the four of them. What had happened was there was an eldest lioness, and the, a new coalition of males came into the area. Four, four big dominant males came into the area, and they then attacked this pride and because those cubs did not belong to them, and they wanted to mate with those females. So the eldest lioness actually took four cubs, and it was only the four young females, and she took them and fled for safety and got out of the area, <clears throat> area excuse me the four young males however were unfortunately killed by the dominant males um, and that eldest lioness and those four young females when they eventually grew up they actually started a pride of their own and that pride is known as the Mangen pride now which is situated their territory is basically on Londolosi and Singita so just south of where we are and they are still around and doing very well and they were originally part of the Salala pride which is also still in that area so those of you who do follow the pride activity in, within the Sabi Sands and within the Kruger you may have heard those names or some of you may have seen those prides the Tsalala pride and the Mangen pride and originally they all came from the Tsalala pride <clears throat> but those four young females split up and ran away with the eldest lioness who is now dead but those four females have done very well for themselves and had cubs and grown the size of that pride so that was interesting to see but that was because they were pushed out by males coming into the area and not necessarily pushed out by the pride Seems as if they've started to settle down now. And Doodles, you say it's so nice to see the cubs running and playing like this. It really is wonderful. And <laughs> that, that little one's got a stick. It's chewing on. <laughs> Just shows you how playful these cubs are. cub was not very happy and you hear the sound that they make even at this young age and you, and you hear it when they're feeding too they can make an incredible growl and noise for little cubs like this they get very aggressive when they are feeding and that happens throughout their lifetime even when they are older and they're hunting or oh, when they're only chasing the other ones So, as I was saying, even when they're older and feeding on carcasses, there's still competition between them. Um, even if it's lionesses or the males, they do get very aggressive around the carcasses because it's survival of the fittest and they fight for the best piece of meat and as much as they can possibly feed on.
I'm not sure where the male has moved to. I, I think it will, I think he's just on the other side of the termite mound. I can't see him anymore. And the females did move off, or at least two or three of them I saw moved off. A little bit further west from here. However, is there some movement? I'm just trying to have a look. It is very thick through here. And I think I can hear a female contact calling, perhaps trying to call these cubs. Yeah, if you listen carefully, we may hear her contact calling. There's a female heading over in this direction now. I think we'll stick with the cubs for a bit and keep watching them and just wait for this female to meet up with them. Listen, watch, you see they've all heard it. They give this very low contact call, just a oh, oh, you can hear it. Look at that. So she's just come back, it looks like, to fetch them and take them away. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to follow them, everyone. You can see it's very thick there, but with almost like a grove of trees. I doubt we'll be able to get a vehicle through there. Um, even with, especially rather, with the roof on at the moment. But what a wonderful sighting. We will try to see where they go. Maybe they come out on one of the main roads. To see some of the cubs are still a little playful and there's this little one trying to is uh, just stretching against the tree again off to the right same tree where they're all stretched in there we go I'm just going to try to stay with them a little bit longer until we lose view of them completely. If they do hang around, that would be great because this interaction is just really wonderful. You can hear that female calling constantly. The male has just got up to, just through to the right of the termite mound. He's moving away at the moment. Not sure if we'll be able to see him. There he goes. Just through there. Alright, I'm going to sit here for a few more minutes. Let's head back to the bushwalk, or Jamie on bushwalk, and she's going to be heading back to camp soon. It's been a fantastic afternoon and I have really truly enjoyed being out here and learning all about or at least trying to learn all about the different birds of this area. So a big thank you to Jandre and to Herbie Jandre for his camera work, Herbie for his amazing spotting skills It is unfortunately time for bush work bush walk this is, this is a terrible pattern I've developed today. Bushwalk to, <laughs> to head home as it starts to get darker. But I will see you on the Sunrise Safari. Until then, let's head back over and see what's out there on the vehicles. <laughs> so it looks like this female's come all the way back in there to fetch the cub. I'm not sure if she's going to get him to follow her. Oh, look at this interaction. 
This is very, very special, everyone. I'm so glad you're... Wow! Gee! <laughs> oh, my... <laughs> Isn't this fantastic? <laughs> sure, these little cubs look like a handful. Let's see now if the female manages to get them to follow her. Listen to the cubs calling. Lioness is moving off now. Let's see if the cubs do follow her. I'm sure they will. But there's... They're being very, very disobedient. <laughs> now, for those of you who are watching who are rugby fans, um, it looks like these lions can teach the rugby players one or two things about tackling. <laughs> they've, been, they've been running and jumping and tackling one another very, very well. Hopefully our national team learns a thing or two. And Graham, you wanted to know how muscular their tails are, and they are very muscular. Most of their tail is muscle. Very, very thick and powerful. A very sturdy tail. So most of it is, is muscle, Graham. Yeah. These two little cubs just don't seem interested in leaving the termite mound. They are very happy and the mother is calling and calling but no success in getting them to follow her. Watch, I th this little one is being stalked by its sibling. Have a look at this. <laughs> oh, there's a little Franklin that just flew off. And the little cub's trying to chase the Franklin. The Franklin knows that it's too quick and can easily get away from. Wow! <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit tricky to view everything that's going on at the moment, but these cubs are all jumping around and pouncing on each other at different times. Okay, there it looks like the cubs have realized that the female was being serious by getting them to move off, and off they go. Look at that. Uh, oh, what an incredible sighting. That was very, very special. <laughs> that was just great.
and off they go. I can just see them disappearing in through that thicket now. Yeah. So it looks like we're possibly going to lose them now moving through this dense bush. I, we really aren't going to be able to follow them. <clears throat> but it was fantastic to be able to spend time with them and our patience definitely paid off. I think sitting here for a while, knowing it's a bit cooler, knowing that we're possibly going to get some movement and interaction from them definitely paid off and we got that incredible sighting. They didn't go and drink like I was hoping they would, but still to get the cubs playing and running and pouncing on one another and even tackling the female at the end there, that was really, really great. We're going to see if we can move out of here um, and just see where these lines do go. Uh, let's head back to Brent and get an update. Welcome back, guys. We came to just have a quick look where the sticks were. Thanks very much, Tax. I'll see you more than Konzo. I'm going to have a check. Uh, but it looks like there might have been a herd of elephants through here that might have chased those two sticks, ladies. So this is where Taxon went off-road. So I'm just checking that they're not still flat cat under a bush here somewhere. But where we saw them this morning, an elephant's actually pushed down a tree. Okay. So I'm assuming from Tax's vehicle tracks that they were sleeping right here somewhere. And I think if we can spot an Eremomola, we can spot a lion. So they might have moved off a bit. So I'm just going to have a look on the main road quickly. See if there are any tracks of them crossing. Okay, whoops, the daisies. No footprints here. Maybe they didn't move too far when the Ellies chased them. Depends how upset the elephants were. Just look carefully, carefully here. Well, it seems like the road maintenance teams were out in force today, but no sign of a track there. So they could still be on our side. Let's just check very carefully. Ground's quite hard, but I think we won't miss a lion track here. Oh, that's, what is that? Is that a, no, is that a stump for them? Yeah, it's a stump. It's a stump. Here's a big game path. And we're looking to see if their footprints cross here. They don't. They might have moved to the other side of the termite mound. Depends if the elephants came from this side or the other. No sign of tracks just yet. see something? No. Oh, no, oh yes, on the other side of the old hyena den, yeah. There's a clearing there. Tristan, Tristan. Hmm, conundrum. I thought we would just take a quick break from the birds. See if we could see a big cat of our own. So I'll show you where we found them this morning. Or where Rex found them and we saw them. Okay, now let's have a look here. So we were trundling along here, coming to see the Styx lions uh, with Rexon. 
and uh, that tree was not across the road. The lions were lying right over here, over there. So I think they got rudely interrupted by an elephant. Now, which way did they run is another question. Let's, we've checked up here. Let's check this way a little bit. Now, if they have full bellies and they're not particularly fussed, they sometimes don't run too far from eddies. Oh. As I said, it looks like the elephants came from the, from the south. So, logically, one would say that possibly they chased them north. Hold on, Vim. What was that? That looked like a honey badger disappearing. Hang on. Not a lion, but something interesting nonetheless. Where? Oh, not a honey badger. But it just, it's getting a bit dark. It was a, is it still there? Oh no. Oh, sorry, our camera's having a, a minor malfunction. Oh, whatever it is is gone. Oh. At high speed. Okay, well, let's keep checking for the lions. Let's see, there we go. This is a spot where I might be able to see some tracks. Okay. The elephants have knocked over a lot of trees on that road. Let's just have a look. There's some softer soil here. No lion tracks. The mystery of the disappearing Styx lioness. Hopefully we can solve it shortly. Oh, the elephants have made, oh, big mess in this area. What's that there? Does that look like a lion to me? I'm not sure. Could be. Or is it a, a pale looking stump? It's a pale looking stump. Okay, we're going to do one last little dash through here. It seems like we're having a bit of a, a problem with our camera. We do apologize uh, if we don't find the lions in the, the next 10 seconds. Uh, I think we'll go back and see what Byron's up to, but let's go. Come on, lions. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, two, no lions. So let's go see what Byron's up to. Hang on, I just want to see everyone. I think maybe I've come around uh, towards a road and a clearing. I'm hoping that these lions head out in this direction. Maybe we get to see them again. Uh, Hang on. Just gonna go forward a little bit further. I think I saw the male through the thicket and I'm sure these other lines, here we go, here we go, straight ahead. Found them, fantastic. I thought they're gonna head in this direction, come out into the open and here comes the whole pride. You're gonna see them shortly. Oh, there we go. Well, two females, the rest seem to be following. Oh, isn't that great? There we go. Now at least we get to see them. Oh, what bird was that? Shucks. <laughs> so busy watching the lions, forgetting about our birding. I am sorry, I do apologize. It actually looked like a martial eagle, but a very brief view of it. I'm not sure. 
Here comes another lioness and some cubs. They're going to be coming into the frame shortly. And oh, look at these two lionesses fight or playing. Oh, fantastic. And we just spoke about this. Remember I said you do still get lionesses in cool weather when they wake up and they get a bit active and they are very playful at times. And it's great to see the adults behaving this way. I can't tell you how happy I am to see these lions behaving like this. They seem happy. Um, and they just... Uh, they look rejuvenated. I think that's the best word to describe it. They really do. Almost like a new energy. And the cubs and everyone's joining in. Watch. <laughs> oh, yes. Look at that. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Wonderful. Isn't that great? I'm going to try to stick with them there and see where they go and where they move. They're really, really fantastic. I'm so happy. And you can hear the little cubs are vocalizing again a little bit, soft little calls. What I'm going to try to do is catch up with those females quickly. Just because there's so much interaction between them, they're very, very playful. <laughs> so, Sheehan, you want to know how a lion or leopard, lion or leopard mother, um, get their cubs or tell their cubs to stay in an area if they are moving off to go and hunt? So, I think uh, with the lions, it's usually a Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's funny. They do communicate. <laughs> they do communicate with them, um, and they will give different calls, and it's, it's instinct. I think the cubs just know when the lions, the lionesses are serious to go off and hunt. They know to stay in an area, and the lionesses will call once or twice and move off, and then the cubs know they need to stay there for safety, and they'll wait there until the lionesses come back to call them. Same thing with leopards. A leopard, and I've seen many times leopards will take their cubs into an area, a thicker area, and they will contact call once or twice and leave them there and move off and and, um, and go and hunt so it is instinct it is a bit of communication from the adults to the cubs but it's instinct for them to just stay in that area and stay there because they know that is where they're going to be safe Listen to that sound. <laughs> Trying to suckle from that mother, from that female. I did get a glimpse of the male earlier, but he was lying further back. It's almost like he thought, well, maybe he's not going to follow the pride unless they hunt something fairly soon. I mean, he may join up with them a little bit later, probably follow them. This is great.
Shai Town, Connie, you want to know how does the pride decide to move? We. You know, Oh, those lioness unfortunately just chased each other off, but through some thick trees. It's difficult to um, to view them through here. I'm going to try and move and catch up to those lionesses because they seem to be very active. But getting back to the question now, it's not, it's very difficult. I think uh, it's very difficult to tell exactly why they decide to move. Perhaps they've just decided that they've rested enough and that they are now ready to move on, continue. It's cool enough. Um, that the temperature isn't too hot for them to move around and one or two lionesses could decide there's not necessarily one lioness that decides every time um, sorry I'm just trying to get out of here quickly so the, as I say it's very difficult to say if there's ex an exact moment in time um, it, I don't think so I think it's just a case of when they all decide it's time to get up and move or one decides to get up and move probably stimulates the others or gets the others um, interested in moving and then they uh, then they head off there we go One female with two cubs. The other cubs are coming and heading towards her. Cat from Tampa, you want to know are these lions anywhere near the dead hippo? No, cat they're not. They're very far away from that area actually. So I don't think they're going to find the carcass unless they they move around quite a lot tonight and there might be a possibility. <laughs> hmm, this is really, really amazing. Get a bit of light on there, how's that? A bit better. <laughs> walking <laughs> over that line is <laughs> oh this is really really amazing and isn't that great wonderful our patience paid off remember I said so I've got a feeling they're going to move around and do something for us and we could not have asked for better interaction than this to see how playful lions can be and it appears I can I think I can just see the mail coming through um, there's another lioness coming through there but the male is following is behind some trees now we can't see him all right I think uh, where did that male go now? Oh, there he comes. Let's just have a look at the male following through. There he comes. He's got a little bit of a limp. Now, that uh, I don't think it's necessarily a bad injury or anything. Uh, sometimes these males, they get a bit older and they move around. They do occasionally hurt their paws, um, perhaps if they um, are hunting. And also they get really stiff when they end up sleeping and resting for most of the day. It takes a while for them to loosen up and warm up and uh, that could possibly be what's happening with this male I don't think it's anything serious I've seen male lions get up and limp for a while many many times before I don't think it's a serious injury so no need to worry everyone and, uh, and there he goes there he goes all right, that's fantastic. <clears throat> Wonderful, I'm going to see where these lines go now. Um, we are very close to our northern boundary, the Buffalo's or Cut Line. So let me just see where they do go, but I think they are going to be crossing soon. 
Uh, let's head to Brent for an update and I'll keep an eye on these lions for a short while. Well, it is getting darker. The lions are on the move and that's very exciting. Uh, VM and I are throwing a roll of the dice to see if the Queen of Juma decides to come back. So we're going very slowly up our southern boundary. Of course, we'll start looking for some nocturnal bird species shortly. And uh, we have a soup. We've gone past our 50 for the day. We're actually on 57 on camera today, which is incredible. And that's just on Rusty. So with Jamie and with Byron, we did get over 60 birds. So well done, us! Yay! Now, wouldn't it be nice to add some bonus hours to get the Rusty list up to 60? Uh, we went and had a look where the Styx Pride were. They were gone. It looks like they got chased by elephants, as I was saying, and we can't see where they went. Oh, there's a car coming. Let's turn our lights off. Now, oh, who's that? Is that Ephraim? Let's see what Ephraim has to say as he makes his way back down to Cheetah Plains. Oh, hey! Sharp, what are you beautiful? Um, you have I... nice pictures today. Always nice pictures. Yes. yes, today we've been only looking for birds. For birds? Because it's birding for... big day. And we have got, we have put 50, oh, on this vehicle, 57 different species of bird on the camera today. Yes. Oh, yes. Your chain, will you tell them, because they are new. Um, oh, um, well, sorry, um, we are live at the moment, so everyone just give me a second. So we're doing a live safari. Um, uh, you can find us on the website wildsafarilive.com uh, or on YouTube with the channel Safari Live. So you can see all the animals you've been seeing here every day at home. Uh, we do it six hours a day. And you can even ask us questions by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Ah, so, and, uh, well, hopefully we'll hear you and just let us know if you do send us questions, say, oh, we met you, we were cheetah plans and I'll answer your question. Okay, there we go. It was nice to meet you anyway. Yes, perfect, I will do. I'll send it through to the lodge. Yeah, if, if, if knows it, I'll send it a message. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Yes. Lovely to meet you. Good, enjoy your rest of your safari. Bye. Bye. Sorry about that, guys. Um, Always nice to meet someone who's uh, possibly going to become a new Safari Live fan. From Germany would be my guess. And from the accents, what do you say, Vim? Sounded German, yes. So no sign of the Queen just yet. But of course we haven't given up on our birding endeavors. And uh, um, unfortunately, I, I, I don't want to tell you, but I have to tell you because I'm quite excited about it. While we were off air, I saw a first for me in the northern Sabi Sands. Uh, it was a very, very quick, quick glimpse uh, of a highly mobile bird. And it is the first time I have seen them in the northern Sabi Sands. First time I've seen them in the last yeah, two years since I've been here, or well, nearly two years. Um, well, what are we looking for? And uh, it is an incredibly beautiful bird and an incredibly savage bird. And uh, where is a picture of the said savage? Oh dear. Oh, I mean, not that one, not that page, not that page. Here we go. Now they are quite distinct and it's definitely the first time and I wonder whether it's the rain that's getting them moving. So there we go, the peregrine falcon. Oh, and it flew over us. It actually was trying, to, from the looks, it, try, it was trying to catch a red crested Koran and was plummeting to earth. So of course that uh, is the fastest bird. It reaches terminal velocity. Of course not while it's flying but when it dives. So how they hunt is they will fly up above, they'll see something below, they close their wings and they go down literally at terminal velocity, so at over 200 kilometers an hour and they just smash into whatever there is and that, that's what enables them to catch often birds much bigger than themselves. Now for those of you who live in big cities uh, in the US and in Europe, 
if you look carefully in those skyscrapers there's actually in quite a few places London New York there are peregrine falcons nesting and living uh, mostly feeding off the flying rats the feral pigeon or um, uh, common pigeon I'm trying to think of its other name feral pigeon we call it here um, oh. But yes, so that's what they mostly feed off in the in the big cities. I think they're also in Paris. Um, I know for a fact New York, and no fact London, Paris, um, Madrid. I'm trying to think where else. Somewhere in Germany as well. So. It's always awesome to know that one of those apex avian predators has managed to survive in the hustle and the bustle of Manhattan. Now I've got a few favorite spots for owls and night jars, so we'll start making our way towards there. Well, Catherine says that the friendliest bird in Canada is a red-capped chickadee. I have never seen one of those. And she wants to know, what do I think the friendliest bird in South Africa is? Hmm. <laughs> the yellow-billed hornbill. <laughs> Uh, not so much friendly as annoying and uh, when you live in a camp they become very used to people and uh, they are an irritating alarm clock when you don't want one. So on the odd morning that we get to have a little lion, uh, which means we sleep generally till the sun comes up and sometimes we manage to sleep beyond that. Uh, when we do do that, uh, Mm, well, at our house and at Inga's house, what happens is the yellow-billed hornbill lands on your doorknob and looks at himself in the glass and thinks he's got a bit of competition. So you get waken up uh, just after sunrise, which is, as you know, just after five o'clock uh, when you're trying to have your little nap with a duck, 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 duck. Um, but friendly, I don't know. I don't think any of the birds are particularly friendly. Uh, we've got some savage birds. Uh, there's a a whole load of domestic geese that live at Zoo Lake in Johannesburg that would eat your feet off if given the chance. Um, I don't know, Vim, friendly bird? A barbet, <laughs> a barbet yes. Uh, but probably the birds that become the most relaxed in human present are all the birds that live around uh, safari camps or human habitation. So uh, your hornbills, starlings, babblers, buffalo weavers. And there we go. And there's, yeah, as I said, buffalo weavers. And what else? Oh, Franklins, yes. Uh, the Natal and, and, and crested Franklins become very, very relaxed around the camps. And it all depends on which part of South Africa. Now, to give you an idea, well, Southern Africa uh, has 940 odd bird species. I think North America doesn't even have half that, if I remember correctly. So there's lots of friendly birds depending on where you are in South Africa. Or maybe the jackass penguin or the African penguin uh, that live in sometimes in people's gardens in Simon's Town uh, uh, in Cape Town. They, they're quite friendly and can be quite a pain as well if they get into your rubbish, make a big mess. But uh, I suppose it's, it's quite a difficult one. I've never thought of birds as friendly. Zoe. Now, Zoe is wondering what would be the smartest bird in South Africa. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, for <laughs> I actually think one of the smartest birds in South Africa isn't even from South Africa. It's, uh, it's become feral uh, uh, in Indian minor. So, it's a starling species from India uh, that has become feral and is actually a problem bird in South Africa. That's probably one of the smartest birds. Uh, and then another bird from India, also very smart, the Indian house crow. That's also an exotic species. Uh, but any of your, your crow species are generally quite intelligent in comparison to the rest. I think probably one of my favorite and not so known 
uh, out of a considered intelligent bird species is the uh, green-backed heron. Now they will actually catch insects like a grasshopper and it'll go perch on a little flowing stream. They do this in the Okavango quite commonly and he'll pop the grasshopper down and let it drift down waiting for a tilapia to come up and as the tilapia comes up he grabs the fish. That's quite clever. Green-backed heron. And of course all your parrot species are generally quite intelligent so your brown-headed, uh, grey-headed parrot, cape parrot, mayor's parrot, uh, rupel's parrot. Um, Vim, what do you think is the smartest bird? Yes, Vim agrees, the Indian miner. So it's a, it's one of the few starling species that can actually be trained to talk as well. But as I said, they're actually a problem bird here. Yeah? They really attack our indigenous bird species and cause a lot of problems. But they're generally only around very built up areas, uh, towns and cities. Although I have seen one at Arethusa, at the dam, and at the airstrip. So no sign of the queen around there. Hmm. I wonder where she is. There was no no sign of her in the east either. Oh, getting chilly. Hi, Lucas. Lucas says he's read that the wattled crane, which is actually an endangered species in South Africa, uh, will only ever raise one chick even though it lays two eggs. Uh, with a lot of bird species you'll find that is the same, especially with any predatory bird, the raptors. Uh, they practice something that's called Cain and Abel syndrome or siblicide. So generally the first baby out of the egg will kill and in some cases eat uh, the second egg as it as it as it hatches. Now we're in that quiet period where there's very few birds calling but the insects have started. So if we just keep quiet and listen and there could be the odd frog starting as well. Oh! Night, night jar calling. Up ahead. There's a fiery neck nightjar calling in the distance. Well, I try to go find the fiery neck nightjar so we can try and get to the miracle number of 60 on Rusty today. Let's go see what Byron's up to. So, we haven't had much luck just yet with any nocturnal animals. I think it is very, very cool, so possibly not too much flying or crawling about. Now, I'm in an area where we have seen quite a few bush babies in the past so I'm hoping that maybe we spot one or two jumping around who knows, maybe we get lucky scanning very carefully for those very large red eyes but it doesn't seem like they are awake yet and it is difficult to spot them Would be great to find a chameleon or a scorpion again. Let's see. Or maybe even a little genet or a civet walking around. That would be great. I'm really trying to get the the um, the art of multitasking, driving, spotlighting, and talking, and <laughs> maybe I, I'm getting better at it, but it's, it does take a bit of practice, that's for sure. Uh, sure, not too much art. Symbols, you want to know if we've heard a wild parrot say anything like domestic parrots can 
no. Um, the wild parrots that we get out here, they've got very high-pitched whistling calls. I've never heard them uh, mimic anything out here. I uh, don't think these wild parrots mimic at all. So not like domestic parrots. Well, in this area, I mean, in, in Africa, the parrots that we get, the, especially the brown-headed parrots and that, all have a distinct whistling call. But, um, but they don't mimic and don't... I've never heard one speak, that's for sure. You made a comment about Brent's uh, discussion he was having with the smartest and the cleverest or, or the smartest and friendliest birds around. And you said, what about the honey guide? And I have to agree with you. That honey guide is incredibly smart and very friendly. It will come look for you. And it's, I mean, you saw the other day, well, hopefully you saw, it took me right to a beehive. And it's, um, it's incredible how intelligent those birds are to get somebody or something like a honey badger to follow them around to take them to food or take them to a beehive so that they can get some of the honey and the bees and the insects that are in there and then uh, and then obviously we benefit from it get some honey just like a honey uh, the honey badger will uh, yeah not much going on here at the moment Looking very carefully, but I think because of this windy weather, cold, windy weather, probably not going to have too much nocturnal wildlife. Uh, and you could still see the odd chameleon holding onto a branch. But it, the weather and the climate definitely affects the animals, and they don't move around as much. See if we can find a scorpion yeah maybe we're lucky any scorpions no scorpions let's check this tree maybe quickly There's a lot of insects calling at the moment, and if we stop and listen, you might hear them better. And those are, those are little cicadas making that noise. Up in the trees above us, very high pitch ringing sound. There's still a cuckoo calling, a Jacobin cuckoo calling in the distance. Trying to hear if we hear any owls perhaps, that would be great. Actually now with it getting a bit darker, I want to perhaps check that other area again. Just where we usually see those bush babies. Maybe we do get like, yeah, you can hear those cicadas all sitting up in the marula tree above us. We've got to find something. wonder when we're going to get more rain so predictions for rain have been pretty pretty high for this uh, for this weekend said we're going to get a lot of rain so it could be interesting um, 
If it does rain, oh, scrub here. There we go. Little scrub here. Stop. Oh no, <laughs> no. Little side scrub here. There it is. Just off to the. Oh, just disappearing in there. There he is. <laughs> Uh, just disappearing. Little scrub here. It's quite a young one, it appears to be. Not quite fully grown. They get a little bit bigger than that. Um, Junkie, I just wanted to confirm your question. It sounded like you wanted to know if mosquitoes are common in this area. And they are indeed. We have a lots of mosquitoes and this area that we are in um, is a, a malaria area um, so we do have to be careful but it's a low risk area very low risk area so um, it's not uh, well we, we do we are still very very careful but but the mosquitoes there are plenty of mosquitoes in this area okay we're going to continue our search for small nocturnal animals let's head to Brent for an update Unfortunately, we could not find the fiery neck night jar. It did a disappearing act. I was just trying to listen for it again, uh, but we'll keep moving. And I was hoping to possibly hear the burp of a scops owl that we could try hunt down, or any owl calls for that matter, but alas, all we hear is the chit chit of a woodlands kingfisher. I was also hoping we might get some frogs out tonight, but alas, no froggies. Jay says there's about a thousand two hundred species of birds in India and he'd like to know how many I think visit South Africa. Well the one I know that visits South Africa for definite is the Amma falcon and they migrate through India in their massive flocks of thousands. They used to be hundreds of thousands. They breed uh, in South Africa and they migrate all the way through the open grasslands. Now one of the biggest problems is actually people catching them for food with big nets. So catching the, them when they roost, they put up a net while the birds are sleeping, and as they wake up, they grab. Now, uh, they are a falcon, but they're an insectivorous falcon, so they eat locusts, and, and mostly locusts and grasshoppers, actually. And uh, quickly, this Byron. Yes, look what we found, a beautiful genet. High up in the tree. And very high up, but very strange to see one that high. And so exposed, it's right out in the open. What I'm going to do is, it seems very relaxed. Let me try move forward a little bit for us. See if we can see more of the body. Hold on, I'm just going to keep an eye on it. Ah, oh, that is wonderful. I've not seen a genet for ages. Hello. Beautiful. Now, there's that little one. It's got a black tip. Now, can I tell you a little secret? I can never, ever, ever, ever remember which one has got a black tip and which one has got a white tip on the tail. I think this is the large spotted genet. Uh, Kat, can you remember? Um, so. Those viewers who have seen quite a few genets around, um, I always forget. For some reason, it's just, it never sticks in my head. I don't know why. How beautiful is that little creature? Okay. Fortunately, I'm right. The black tip is the large spotted genet. And look at those little ears moving around. Now, a lot of people often refer to it as a genet cat. It is not a cat, everyone. It is not a cat at all. So it's not part of the cat family. These little genets fall in a different family group known as Viveridae. Genets and civets. 
and they are nocturnal, move around trying to feed on insects. This little one is so beautiful. That is such an incredible view of one. Oh, wow, that is really, really great. That has made my day. promise you that is the highlight of, I think, it must be my, uh, I think, the last week at least. Something so different. I love these little nocturnal animals. And because you don't get to see them very often. Well, this and actually the two male lions that were roaring next to us the other night, that is definitely a highlight. So I think these two, both, both events in the evening, which is great. I wonder if this little Janet doesn't live in this tree, perhaps. Maybe it's hollowed out somewhere and it sleeps inside there during the day. It comes out at night to look for insects and look for food. Notice I'm not shining the spotlight directly on him, just off to the side. Because, I, I mean, I don't want to harm his eyes in any way. So I'm actually just shining on the tree, but we can still see him very clearly. You can see his eyes are wide open, so the spotlight's not bothering him at all. I'm glad all of you are enjoying this as much as I am. James, large spotted and small spotted genets for a very similar niche in nature, but it will be d different, definitely. Um, and you know, they possibly just feed on slightly different insects. They're slightly different in size. Um, so, but a similar niche. And a niche, for those of you who don't know, a niche is just the role that they play in an ecosystem. The role that an animal plays in an ecosystem, that is known as the niche. So these genets, these little genets, probably fill a very similar niche, even though they are slightly different subspecies of genet. And look at those ears. Now they can hear little insects and that moving around and flying around. Jackie, you say maybe I should remember it like this, that the black tip, the B-L-A, and uh, large L-A, Janet. So black, large, I think so. Jackie, you know what, that's probably going to stick now. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and it's funny, it just takes something like that, somebody to point it out. And, uh, and I'm, Jackie, I'm almost certain I'm never going to forget it anymore because of that. So thank you. I can hear bats flying around too. I wonder if you can pick it up on the on the ambient sound that we've got. Very high pitched. High pitched whistling sound. Those are little bats. Probably little epauletted bats. I'm not too sure. There are many different species of bats around here. But potentially one of those. All right, well, I've had, we've had such a wonderful view of this little Janet. I don't want to disturb him anymore with the spotlight. He's posed beautifully for us, and it's very seldom you get such an incredible sighting of one. So I'm going to take the spotlight off of him and allow him to continue on his nocturnal behavior for the night. Wasn't that incredible? That was such a great little sighting. Just shows you things happen when you least expect it. And that little Janet just climbed down and is moving off. Grumpy old man, you want to know, is, <laughs> that's a funny to handle. Is this the same as the Cape Janet? No. A lot of people pick up on these names of these little species and they change from Cape to, no, I don't. Okay, we don't have much time. Uh, 
uh, for me to find it, unfortunately. Oh, jeepers. But I don't, I, I'm not sure. Anyway, I'm so sorry. I'll have a look and I'll tell you in the morning. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I hope you've had a wonderful drive. Thanks to the ladies in Final Control, Brent and Jamie and Viem and Jandre, and, of course, to Chat. Good night. Goodbye, everyone. We'll see you on tomorrow's Sunrise Safari.